The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. This is Vince Russo's The Brand. This is episode two of the Brolin Alley with star maker Kenny Bolin, and we have a special guest tonight. Oh, whoa. My personal guest. Man, that don't do too many of these. Rico Constantino. Rico, say hi to everybody. How you doing? In fact, this is my first ever video bot podcast in my eight years in the business. And you sound like you're coming through in Dolby Digital Sound, man. You're sounding good over there. You must have got the microphones. I think you got that headset on for show. I'm sure my <laughs> microphone is off in the background somewhere. I'm a novice, but yeah, it probably came from you, King. It's one of those, well, along with your book, it came. Yeah, well, the book is great, and you paid you paid full price, right? Full retail. Of course. Well, of course. it was dedicated to Rico, but I mean, if I'm going to dedicate it to him, the least he can do is pay for the damn book. And the microphone's fifty nine ninety five. You can purchase those on my Facebook or Twitter accounts. We'll be happy to take care of it. What are you looking at? Because I just asked you, where is Russo? He's supposed to be what? Well, you better not be. Well, we had an issue last yeah, episode. Yeah, he had vertigo. He had vertigo. He had vertigo. Well, what? this time. We are getting out of show. Uh-oh, two cows here. He's stuck All at right. the airport. His flight was delayed on the way back from Vegas to Evansville. And I don't know if you've ever been to that Evansville airport, Kenny, how no, tiny it is. I, it. I can drive to Evansville. I don't need a <laughs> paper airplane to fly in and out of Evansville. Well, yeah, so I guess I still won't meet Vince Russo. Oh, you I'm got are you are you really are you shitting me? I know what we tried to keep us PG thirteen here, but damn. No, what? I've never met Vince Russo. Heard a lot about him, but what? Supposed to hear night. You're supposed to get to talk to him in person, and he promised me faithfully to my face that he would be on here tonight. He stood yeah. up with that damn vertigo. Rico, you heard him. He, he wasn't wrote, standing up at vertigo. Well, no, no. I got vertigo. I yeah. sit down when I got vertigo. Well, yeah, and, and floor, uh, yeah. but, but didn't I do a show with you where you had vertigo? Didn't you show up and do the show? I think so. Uh, on the phone. Yeah, you don't have to answer that question. Of course you did. <laughs> and man, so. Vince Russo backed out of my first ever show on the Brolin Alley. We changed the damn name of the show for him. We took it away from being the Bowling Alley and made it the Brolin Alley because he does that stupid ass bro crap all the time. And I agreed to play along with it and go along if he would actually be on the damn shows with me. I'm the biggest star on his network. No offense to Big Vito and countless others that do this network, but I'm the big dog around here now. I bring in the ratings. I cried for crying out loud on a show on the Bowling Alley to start getting some attention. You see a fantastic acting job I did? Like I'd actually cry over Jimmy Cornette. I should have got an Emmy the other night, but I didn't. So what is his excuse tonight? You said he he's, was stuck at an airport. What airport is he stuck yeah. in? Well, Did you know, maybe we, maybe we should have called this the Bowling Lane. I think we missed, missed, it might uh, missed that on that one. Yeah, it yeah. might be a little more accurate. This is show number two. He's apparently now missing the second show in a row. I'm the big dog of the night. Can you imagine if Pete Rose showed up for the Philadelphia Phillies and the owner and the manager of the Phillies decided not to be at that game? Probably would have done better. You might have. Yes. Yeah, yeah I don't I don't know what airport he was delayed at. I think it was I his connecting know. flight. I, I do know. I heard through a little birdie through my ear that he is stranded in Dallas, Texas. Now he was just in Las Vegas. Right. He done like Chris Jericho did, and he could have went to Rico's house and paid him a damn personal visit. What else was out there? He could have done it here. I got two cams. Oh hell yeah, you he could have. So he could have finally met the man. I could have finally met him. He could You're in Vegas. You're in Vegas, Rico? Yeah. You yep. ever run into uh, the Disco Inferno around those parts? In fact, when I was a police officer, he used to bounce at a club named Sapphires. Still you does. Actually, you actually yeah, have, well, actually, I, I've seen him, and he's he's a classy guy. Got to say. Yeah. I arrested him. <laughs> I heard no. arrested him out there. No, not me. Disco, good guy. I good heard. guy. Speaking of disco, mom, for whatever reason, decided to play Maya, the disco duck video yesterday. <laughs> and I've never seen such terror on a young woman's face. <laughs> we I played her the song on uh, Echo the other day. 
she saw the video this time and we were talking about I, this, Alexa. Is a, this is a complete tangent but uh we showed her the banana splits as well as hr puffins oh oh those oh i remember the banana splits <laughs> yeah oh, they, when i was a kid man i hated they came on cartoon network real late at night and i'd get so annoyed and they'd come on well, All right, but, I don't want to hold the crown for the host show, so I'm going to put the crown down. I thought that I was just going to establish myself as the king pin of podcast to Vince Russo. Let him know who the, I heard. I heard our first show actually beat even Russo in the ratings. <laughs> that was great. Well, we all know you're the king. That is well, no everybody, everybody, but apparently Vince Russo. So yeah, he's stuck in Dallas. Can we? He get was a, in Vegas. Can we get an owner we don't have heat with? Can we just work on that? You, I don't, <laughs> I'm starting to think the problem's me. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm me. pretty sure the problem's you. But here Rico is in Vegas. My good friend Ape Wilson's in Vegas. Uh, both fly here all the time. I don't even think the planes go through Dallas from 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 uh, Vegas to to Louisville. You had an SMU and, game to catch. Southern yeah. Is that you think that's what he's yeah, doing? Yeah, yeah. He wanted to go watch him lose. You think Cuban invited him to see a Mavericks preseason game? You think maybe? Hey, you know, uh, Cuban's be. a huge wrestling fan, big he Attitude is. Era fan. I oh yeah, I got to meet him. Yeah. You did, you yeah. did, and yeah. I introduced him. Uh, Rico, uh, did I not introduce him to professional wrestling on television in Louisville, Kentucky? Said so, correct. Did I not beat Vince McMahon to putting him on television and professional wrestling angles? I believe so. I believe I all did. Right. All right, all right. I got to cut this off. You can mark out for yourself later. You God knows you're going to. Um, we we actually came here tonight with business to do. We have uh, we have all gotten out our golden shovels. We've dug a hole in the backyard, and we've got a we've got a oh fat, nobody to a, put in it. Is it a <laughs> oh well? Wait a sec first before we get going, sure. Mister Lane, Mister yes. Lane. I gotta I gotta say something here. I did watch the season premiere of the Brolin Alley, and you, you put together a fantastic show. Thank uh, you. And when Kenny mentioned me, which I was honored, uh, you put up this picture. <laughs> and I saw this picture, and I, I couldn't believe it. I, I mean, I got to quote my famous arch nemesis of WWE, the Hurricane. Oh, What's God. up with that? <laughs> What I don't do even do? remember which one I used. I don't. Oh even my God! Remember. It's the picture of me with my mouth wide open, looking like I threw up my Thanksgiving dinner. Are I you? mean, it was right there. This picture right there. Okay, you are put you? that one up. Now wait, and you could have used my tiger stripe picture. You could have used the makeup picture, or you could have used the picture on my Wikipedia, which is the red shirt with the three stripes. No, I mean, I, I gotta say it. I gotta say it. Come on, man. <laughs> Why did you? I mean, and for people in my generation, you're killing me, Smalls. You're oh killing me. man! Oh man! Killing me, Smalls. You know, I was actually, I, I was messing around on Reddit last night, and somebody posted the time that you were working. It was something with the Dudleys, and Bubba had you pulled back for the uh, for the was up. Yeah, and you started rubbing yourself and going, "Come on!" And Deep's like, "No, no, no." <laughs> yeah, that was at no mercy when it was yeah, yeah. Uh, Jackie. Charlie and I against Don Marie yeah. and the Dudleys. Yeah, he was going up for the West Up, and I said, come on and bring it. <laughs> that was hilarious. I had forgotten all about that. I, was, I, I did not see that one. I got yeah, that, go. yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one I kissed Bubba in the mouth. Oh, I bet, oh, I bet he loved that. No, no one. I didn't know <laughs> actually, that. Actually, he was giving me crap about the gimmick, like Bob Holly did, Scott yeah. Steiner did. They didn't want to work with me because I was going to do my stuff. Yeah, well, yeah. Bubba, right before Mer Will Mercy pulled his shit, I ain't doing none of this stuff. Well, he got called to Vince's office, uh -huh. and when he came back down, he had a totally different attitude, oh, and, and it was him that came up to kiss me on the mouth. It's amazing. I did. Yeah. Vince's office. It's an amazing. Yeah. Attitude. Holly got it the same way. Very when we get the Judgment Day for the tag titles. Holly says, I ain't doing that stuff. Yeah. Went to the office. Pat Patterson said, Vince wants to talk to you. Came back out. Goes, what are we doing? So, <laughs> so, so the whole thing is a Gilligan Island episode. I won't, You can't make me. You can't make me. You can't make me. And then all of a sudden, they made him. They made him. Uh, they made him. And that's, same, uh, that's why I think I got so high on the cards on, on WWE is because everybody wants to be the tough guy. I mean, from the first match to the main event. I mean, how much tough can you see? You know? People want to get to laugh, take a breath, inhale, and that's what I did for them. You know, I'm a bit of everything. 
Yeah, you know, I wasn't a, a top card guy. I was a mid card guy. My job was to get heat on the faces and then make them. When the face beat me, they would jump out of their seats. Like when I first, when I was with Billy and Chuck, and I was doing the spin kicks to everybody and making them win the matches and keep the belt. When it came time and Rikishi got me in that corner for that stink face, that audience blew up. Yeah, I mean, if they were waiting for something to happen to me. I and that to, was my job. I had to take that from Big Show one night, and that was <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah, that was not fun. Didn't know how to do no. it. I, Is there I video want... of this? Probably. Yeah, there's me of me taking it or Kenny taking it. Well, yeah, I've seen yours. Yeah, I haven't seen. Oh yeah, uh, I'm I, sure it's it, on one of those. It was at a, it was at a triple X show. I uh, remember those triple X shows we did with Donna Daring when Donna Ooh. went her bra ripped off. Yeah, but, yeah, that was a pair of cassavas. Uh, and uh, well, they wanted me to take my uh, uh, pants off. They wanted me to get pants during the match, and I had a in tight white underwear that night. And I said, "No, no, I do business in this town." And there wasn't no Vince McMahon to call me to his office and tell me that I was going to do it. And I just stood back there with Cornet and I said, "No, I am not going to do that. I do business in this town. I got somewhat of a reputation to uphold, and not I'm a good not gonna, one, but I didn't say it was good. And uh, I'm not going to do this." So Jimmy was pissed. He stood there, so you ain't going to do it. You ain't going to take one for the team. I said, "No," and I didn't. I bet pumpkin on his head at Halloween Havoc. Go. Yeah, Jimmy refused to put a pumpkin on his head at Halloween Havoc. I can refuse to be in my tidy whiteies on a strip club in downtown Louisville. Yeah. You know, in all the now Chances that would have been made my way had I been in my tidy whities How many young ladies would have been prospering me for sex? I'm old. I'm a dedicated man. I can't be doing that. That's right. Uh, pretty tight. There was, two, there was two type of stink faces that Rikishi gave you. The working you, type. The, yeah, no, there was there was the shoot stink, <laughs> the stink face, and there was the work stink face. Yeah, now, if he liked you, he went up his back, so it was like right with the small of his back, and yeah. you wouldn't get the chocolate starfish but if he but if he didn't like you yeah. you you got the brown eye you can <laughs> bet what show would have give me he hated me back then <laughs> well, there was no damn way i was taking that he just right in my face i know he was <laughs> 20 minutes what are you talking about taking that from him oh so this, this is all this, this episode took a turn <laughs> well, I had to talk to Mr. Lane, and I hope he fixes it on this one. <laughs> it's gonna get uh, sounds, yeah. sounds like the the heat's on, and he will be fixed. It'll be fixed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I and, and, it, and I have to give props to the lady who does the beginning. Is it Chantel? Is it Chantel? Chantel. Yes. Yeah, honey, I give you a standing ovation, but I knock over the computer. So here's <laughs> the next best thing. Oh. Marvelous job, marvelous job. That's marvelous. I did great, even. great beginning. I didn't even put her over that much. So I <laughs> well, I, I enjoyed it, you know, I, 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 and I think it fits you. Actually, I, I did because I called everybody into the room and said, look at what a job uh, she did and just fan. Yeah, I wasn't here. And, uh, well, we called Chris to the room, but he was still sleeping. So yeah, I, it I, didn't I got a good. bad sleep schedule. Third shift, man. It kills well, me. I don't know yeah. how deeply we are into this show. Russo stood us up again. Vince, uh, yeah. now, a lot of people don't know this. Rico used to be a bodyguard for Benny Hanna. Benny and, uh, yeah. <laughs> When did Benny Hanna? Benny Hanna's a Mongol. Oh, <laughs> bad. Uh, well, I figured maybe that's why you were there. Why he was a bouncer at the Mongolian Grill. You got too yeah. many <laughs> and out. Yeah, you didn't too much. To too much rice for you. Yeah, well, yeah. How many eggs? No, I'd, I'd have eaten a lot of eggs. I really would have. Uh, it was Benny Hinn. So what? What Hinn? Okay. So what made you go to the Seoul, Southeast Korea? Actually. In South Korea, at the northern border, there's actually something Christians go to called called Prayer Mountain. Yeah. And they dig holes in the mountain, and they go in there and pray. Well, Are atheists allowed at Prayer Mountain? Atheists are welcome anywhere. So, you know, hey, Jesus never spent time with Christians. He always spent it with atheist people. People like me. Exactly. That's we, the whores, everything. Yeah, he, he kicked the Christians people like you. He kicked the supposed Christians out of his temple for being terrible Christians. Yeah. Yeah. Was that when he tossed the money changers over? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm more godlike than I thought, huh? Okay. Right. Oh yeah. 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 I may have walked with Jesus and just not known it. Yeah. Well, no, well you no. you probably wouldn't know. No, but, uh, that was Jesus, and we that was oh. all different <laughs> And that was back in the dishwashing room, right? <laughs> 
fucking say that. Cow has decided Woo! to join in this broadcast. Had it just disco. What? Uh, no, that wasn't a cut. I tell you, when I was a young kid, I worked in Dana Point, California, and there was a restaurant called The Bridge. And I was a busboy, and we had this. Close to? Huh? What is Dana Point close to? I'd have made up a city. San Juan Capistrano. <laughs> Dana Point is the harbor yeah, in like Southern it's, California, it's, 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 County. Yeah, so it's called The Brig. Okay. And, uh, we had a little little Mexican guy that did the dishes, couldn't oh. speak much English, but he was good. You know, yeah. I learned a little Spanish. Yeah. And immigration would shoot in there like every other month, take him away. He'd be gone. He'd only be gone one week. The next <laughs> week, he'd be right back and scrubbing the dishes and doing that and working away. Right. I mean, and a great guy. He yeah. need so everything. Didn't complain, hard working. So, you Everything know, I'm against. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I but I'll tell you. Oh, heard it all. I was uh, John Wayne Airport in Santa Ana. I used to work construction. I was what? a laborer. John Wayne has an airport? Oh, my God. It used to be called Santa Ana Airport, but they changed it to John Wayne. They oh, made it of course bigger. They, did. they didn't consult me on that. The no, had- they must not have. But I was a, I was a laborer in John Wayne Airport, and that's mostly with the Mexican culture. And what I loved about it is that we never went to the the, the truck. We never – everybody brought something, like the jalapenos, the tortillas, the uh, chorizo, every, and everybody sat in a circle, and share, and we all ate lunch. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it was some I'd of the best time. That. I'd have been in on that part. Oh, man. I wouldn't have, and, I wouldn't have anything, but I was sitting in a circle and ate yeah. lunch. Yeah, but it was a great time. That. One of them. Learned culture, and the, like I said, there are hard workers. Oh, Coca-Cola Zero. Very good. I got my my Italian grape juice. <laughs> this is the new stuff. I, I'd, I'd drink some Italian grape juice if I had any. You mean yeah, that, that's called wine. Oh, well, I can't <laughs> what, 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 You thought you had actually imported Italian grape We're all juice. gathered here today. He went to Whole Foods. <laughs> okay, let's get to what we need to get to. We're all gathered here today, and not – to get Billy and Chuck married, <laughs> like the last time those quotes came out of someone's mouth. Yeah, today because and 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 none of us know where this is going to go except for me and Rico and Chris. Uh, but Bruce, <laughs> so, so everybody but me, for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nobody buzzed everybody, him. No one clued him in. So um, we're here oh, cool. because of what Bruce Pritchard had said. We weren't sure if we could play the audio because he might sue us. Uh, because we played what he actually said. So we decided we would read what he said. And being as I can't read, we're going to have Jeff Wayne do it. Yes, this is from something to wrestle with. But he was talking about Rico getting ready to cut a promo for the wedding. And he said, Rico was legit flustered. He had a shitload to do that day. The idea was that Rico would be on his cell phone flustered with the wedding planner. I tried pre-taping it. And he couldn't get it. He just wasn't flustered enough because he was actually flustered and he was trying to act. (laughs) I remember this one specifically. I said, Rico, we're going to do this live. And damn it, you got to get the shit out of your head. I need you to be flustered. And he was trying so hard. I told the guys to count me down. Let me know exactly where we are before we go live. And eight seconds before we were going live, Rico had the phone up to his ear and I slapped the living fuck out of him right across the face and knocked the phone out of his hand, and his phone broke. He was so flustered trying to pick up the phone. It was the best backstage thing he ever did because he was shoot flustered. And afterwards, I hugged him and said, please don't kill me, and thank God he forgave me. Okay. Rico, before you speak, I want you to analyze every word that Jeff Lane just said, and I want you to tell me what percentage of every word that came out of Bruce Pritchard's mouth that he read is true. Rico, the state is yours. Well, I know me, all right, and I, I don't want this to turn into a he said, she said, uh, of course, me being the he. Um, <laughs> Bruce uh, he. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't remember ever being slapped by anybody in the WWE. Um, I mean, unless it was in the ring, you know, we were working. Um, if, if this was true one of two things would have happened one bruce would have probably slapped me so hard and my brain would have hit a reset button and i had instant amnesia (laughs) and i wouldn't have remembered the incident or two 
if we were going live in five seconds or whatever that was, and he had slapped me in the face, I know what I'd have done. I'd have taken my right foot and brought up a roundhouse kick, kicked him on the side of his face with my right foot. He'd have went to the ground, and with my left foot, I would have curb stomped his front teeth out of his mouth. Uh, that's me. Uh, that's so, yeah, that's the Rico I know. <laughs> uh, uh, listen, um, there's a dark side to everybody. Before you continue, you mentioned the amnesia thing, and, and in case you all may have worked, how many times do you recall working brother love in WWE matches? None. I saw him in the 80s. Rico, I just want to clarify something about who Rico is to me. When I was about 9 or 10, I was you know getting into martial arts. I was training a lot. I was friends with you, and I knew that you were a legitimate tough guy. In one night, we as a group were at Steak and Shake on Dixie Highway. We were having dinner. We always ate at Steak and Shake. No. Yeah, us? Yeah. Really? Especially the three of us? No. Yeah. And I remember that some shady characters came in. And Rico just instinctively grabbed one of the steak knives that was on the table and kind of put it in his arm. And I said, you know, you're Rico. You don't need a steak knife. You could beat these guys with one arm. And you said, Chris, I'm 38. I've been in all the street fights I want to be in. I'm going home. I have a wife. I have kids i'm going home and we didn't know what they had in that and that stuck with me for years that you know and that's honestly something that i've i'll tell my like i'm going home you've adapted you've adapted yeah that that, i'm going home going home yeah and uh that you've given that to me and so the idea that anyone would attack you and just off of instinct that you wouldn't hurt them is nonsense to me if anybody and this is me my dad another instant i remember somebody dropped a plate and you were on the ground behind the chair looking for where it came from before the sound had stopped instinctively you just know how to protect yourself that's what you did so yeah. that anybody would do anything offensively to you and not have repercussions is nonsense that goes against everything you've trained as a police officer as a martial artist as a bodyguard everything for yeah. so just to clarify how what bullshit this is to anyone who truly knows rico I just want to put my two cents in there. And if I remember correctly, you were also uh, in and trained by the CIA as, as well, correct? Well, no, federal U.S. Marshals, because I was a part-time U.S. Marshal, so I went there training. For 11 years, I was a state investigator full-time and a part-time U.S. Marshal at the Lloyd George Building in Las Vegas, where I did high-profile trials, transported prisoners, booked prisoners for other agencies like DEA, ATF, ICE, Uh, postal inspectors and stuff like that. So, and transporting prisoners to and from California, high risk prisoners where I had a a nine millimeter on my side an M4 around my chest and we're driving 90 miles an hour to California, you know, in a van and a chase car. We weren't stopping for nobody. This prisoner had to get there. So yes, I've had a lot of training started with Ed, 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 Ed Parker, Kempo went to Japanese style Odu Styru with Mu Tai and my instructor for Odu Styru, he was a South African who won two gold medals in the World Games for competing. And then I ended up in Texas with Taekwondo where I received my first Dan black belt. So I have good legs as everybody saw in my shows or when I entertained. Now it's a lot to learn those kicks, but it's also harder to throw those kicks and look and be real and pull them yeah, at yeah, the last, so you're not going to hurt somebody kick them in the temple and stuff a lot of my kicks was that to the head you know the step over reverse mule kick yeah. that was a made-up thing actually fit finley helped me with that that's just a reverse mule kick you know when you kick somebody behind you i just did it with a scoop so wrestlers could take a bump yeah my, yeah. my thing was when i step over your arm look at my ass so they would turn their head and then the kick would go and they wouldn't feel it. But if they furthered out a little bit, my calf would knock them in the nose. I think I got Jericho once. I got Holly with it on accident because they didn't look at my ass. Yeah. But, 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 but you but, felt bad about it. Shit happens. Yeah, shit happens. Oh, I've got receded a lot. But again, with like uh, what Prince said, I'm not into fair fighting. I don't fight fair. And... At a young age, I was bullied a lot because I was very small. My freshman year in high school, which was military school, I was 4'11", weighed 82 pounds. Holy mackerel. Well, and mean- Yeah. Uh, and oh, we used God, to carry M1 Grand rifles. They were so big, I couldn't carry a rifle. So there was another kid named Ronnie Carr who we were the same height. 
So we carried the banner in front of the parade. (laughs) That's where we fit, you know. So that's my ninth grade. I I graduated high school 119 pounds at at 5'10". Are you? So I was a very, no. When I was 20 years old, I was this height at 126. And that's when I started working out. I was, uh, I graduated high school. I was six foot, almost six one and weighed 212. When I, a little bit. Yeah, I know because I wrestled through high school, 98 pounds my first year, 105, 112, and 119. I was 82 pounds, so when they went to weigh us, I'd be on the scale with a Snickers bar eating it, and the, the ref would drop the weight, and then here come this other guy who's been spitting, eating lettuce, you know, and he's like just waiting for that thing to drop, and I'm eating the candy bars, you know, <laughs> so they double hate me when we wrestled. But like I said before, so in life, like there's good people and there's bad people and there's people who choose a dark side of their life. And there's people who are pushed into it and need to go into it. Now, when I say I'm dark, I'm black. If you, if you call my dark side black, that's too colorful. <laughs> like I said, I don't fight fair. And if you slap me like that and I'm not expecting it, what I would have done would have been just reaction, just complete reaction, kick, stomp, and that's it. So, but. But we've seen you react to far less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's some feedback I got, Rico, as uh, people were pissed that I was calling Pritchard out because Pritchard really brags for some reason about no guest needed. So hmm. they talked some crap on Russo here a while back. Russo wanted to come on to the show and, and answer those allegations. And uh, Jeff, if I'm correct, they would not have Russo on the show, correct? Yeah, I don't know what their exact wording was, but it was along the lines of we, we don't have guests. Yeah, we don't so- have yeah. And, um, and uh, I uh, suggested to him to have Rico on or me, either of us could, uh, but Rico would be the best one. He's the one they claim they did it to. Yeah. And that, that offer was uh, turned down. And then I said, well, why don't you come on being as you don't have guests? Guess what? We do. And especially when they lie on personal friends of mine. So why don't you password on to Bruce being as he ain't got the guts to answer my emails or my tweets. And uh, Conrad actually follows me on Twitter, or at least he used to. He may not now. Uh, he won't. But, but I said, why don't you have uh, you or Pritchard, being as Pritchard's the one talking all the show, have Pritchard come on the show. And I put all these tweets out and all these invitations. And Jeff, I'm sure you saw them. And uh, they went totally ignored. And uh, and then the fans start chiming in. And the fans say, well, good Lord, King, don't you understand that Bruce is a storyteller and that maybe he enhances some of the stories for the fans' entertainment? That means he's full of shit. I said, well, that's what I do. I, I'm a storyteller and enhance stories, obviously, for anybody who's got a functioning brain cell. And they know when I'm telling the truth and shooting. The real fans, the real ones that really know me. And there's and there's others that actually fall for everything I say. Those are what, Chris? The the Marks? The Mizarks, yeah. The Miz- they, they hate it when you call them. They I know. They like hate it. Marks. I don't know why they don't, don't, know why they don't like it. You know, that. Maya's that conversation with me that I'm too mean to the Marks. I'm too abusive to the Marks. And what and what is Vince's show? Castrating Cast, the Marks. I, I want to do a castrating the Marks. I'm I'm really he has a show called Castrating yeah. the Marks. So uh, that was their defense: is that Bruce was just telling a story, and on a man who let, let's face it, you may not be able to tell it by looking at him, but it's been through a lot the last year or so. Has been on death's door a time or two. Uh, I've been on death's door a time or two, and he was way off, way worse off than I was. And even when I was dealing with some serious crap. My dedication was to raising money for him and trying to make sure he was with us a little bit longer. Uh, I mean, I had a rough four days when Chris told me what he was going through because Rico hadn't told me yet. He, he informed Chris. Then I found out, and Rico was refusing help from everybody and wouldn't take no help. I said, well, sorry, you're going to get some anyway thank, if I got anything to say about thank it. Thank God we got it for you. And uh, things are now finally going much better for Rico. He's able to get some food, the medication that he needs, some bills paid, some stress off his life. And uh, and he's still got an uphill battle, and and you hardly hear him say a word about it. He's been on here for quite a while now with me, and you hadn't heard a word about it. We've tried to have some fun and answer these allegations. But you do not talk on a very sick man and then try to get yourself over by claiming you bitch slapped him backstage at a WWE show, and he didn't tell it as a story. He told it as it was the God's honest truth. I Trust me. After 30 years in this business, I know a work when I when I see one or hear one. Or take part in one. Or take part in one. And he was doing none of the three. He was trying to get himself over to make people think that he bitch slapped Rico Constantino and that Rico didn't do anything about it. And that's what pissed me off. And whether people realize this or not, because the character was so over the top and exaggerated, 
Rico at the time was probably one of the top five toughest guys in the company. And you may have been even I don't than know. That. I don't know the four that would have bit, whipped his ass. Uh, Angle, maybe. I mean, benefit of the doubt, Olympic gold medalist wrestler, Kurt Angle would have given you a run. But uh, Angle ain't going to go places that Rico would do. No, Rico's That's the killer. thing we got to remember that. Yeah. And yeah. I like two hit fights. I hit you, you hit the floor. Yeah. In that, in <laughs> and, that, that, and then I leave. You know, <laughs> I'm not there to, to gloat. You know, um, <laughs> I don't. I don't like. Nobody ever wins a fight. I'll go for your eyes. I'll. I'll. I'll chap your throat. I'll clap your ears. I'll bite your ears off. I. I don't like fighting, and yeah. it, you know. So and it's and this isn't Marcus or Queensberry rules. No, You're gonna no. fight me. I'm taking something now. You know. I'm not winning all the time, and yeah. I have a motto. I might not get any steak, but I'm sure going to get some hamburger. I'll <laughs> tell you that. You know. <laughs> And I faced five at once. Yeah. My brother and I took on about 20 people in Long Beach. He was there at a karate tournament winning. Uh, he was number one in the world in his weight class for point fighting. And I was there doing a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle guest appearance as the American Gladiator Champion. Why were you doing a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle? I know you. You could do better than that. Well, I was as American Gladiator Champion. You didn't listen I, to that. I know, I know. Right. You shouldn't be doing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. They're teenagers. <laughs> They're also fans. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I did a lot of things. So, did you know, we of, were coming back and we were in Long of, Beach. Yeah, heard here, folks. Rico's done a lot of turtles. Yes, done a lot of turtles. So, but yeah, it started a fight. I mean, I got scrapped up and my brother and they ran. And the police came to the hotel. And they said, well, what happened? Can you identify them? And we walked around the corner. And I and the people that were laying down, I said, yeah, that one, that <laughs> one, that, that turtle, one, that it one. Turtle. It was Michelangelo. It was yeah. No, I was done with the turtles. I was done with the thing. We were on our way to get something to eat. Oh, Lord. Turtle soup. So, but, you know, it's just, and I, I don't like talking about this a lot. But, again, now. I can sit here and say, okay, I'm going to call him back out. He's going to call me back out. Just let me give you some facts. Jeff, are you ready? I'm ready. Here's facts. Back in the Billy and Chuck era, SmackDown was not live. No, SmackDown no. was a tape thing. It was done on Tuesday. Okay. So if you had a backstage segment or something and you couldn't get it, we would do it in post-production afterwards. Because I had to do that one time. I was supposed to be part of a uh, in the locker room group or protesting something. I wrestled my match, washed my face up. It was all done. And then somebody came and said, Stephanie wants you. Well, I go to where they're doing a post-production. And Stephanie goes, you're out of character. We need you for this. I said, give me 10 minutes. I put my makeup back on, put my tights back on. I ran back. And we did a post-production while everybody was leaving. So SmackDown wasn't live. Now, if I cannot, no one's pointed that out yet. Yeah, that's actually we're, go, really we're going live, point, and yeah. I didn't yeah. think about it. There what, wasn't not live. It wasn't live anyway. No. So if they had to put it in post production, they would. Now, mind you, um, if I cannot get a 15, 20 second vignette done in like what do you say, twenty takes, ten takes, uh, fifty takes? I forget what number he quoted, but he acted like it was just going on forever. Okay. Well, let's say let's say 10. I'll just I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. 10. One, they wouldn't waste 10 takes on me. If I couldn't get it in the first 5, they'd scrub it. Okay? Now, if I couldn't get a 15 second vignette done, then how come I got a four and a half page monologue dialogue in the wedding in one take and everybody's movement was when I made my my comment, it you. set off the Godfather to come out, this person to do this, this person to do that. So not only did I have to memorize my lines, I had to memorize their lines. So if I couldn't do a 15-second vignette, that would have gone to Vince. Yeah. Well, if he can't do that, we're not going to give him this responsibility. That, that would be yeah. obvious. That would be obvious. Okay. Now, my background, American Gladiators. After each event, if you won it, you got interviewed. So you were live and had to do a promo type right after each event. Now, after the gladiators, I went to France and did like a ninja warrior gladiator type thing to a show called Conquer Fort Boyard. 
Two American teams went. Two boys and two girls on each team. I won that. Same thing with right there interviews with Chris Berman and did that show. Came back, I played a heel in Conan the Barbarian show. Universal Studios had to talk there. I played Batman at Six Flags. Remember Batman. And I had, to, I had to talk there. Then I was part of John Jacobs and the power team. Worked five days a week. Now I had to be on the mic at least once those days. You know, telling stories, preaching, or talking to kids in school. Oh, that's, that's the phone book ripping guys, right? Yeah, phone book, break brick and handcuff smashing ice, bending steel in our teeth. Okay, I had to talk at least sometimes twice a day, once a day. So I have all this mic and crowd experience. And I've done a movie, Damien Omen 2. I have did a Jane, Joan Rivers special. I was on a series that was piloted. I was on three of five episodes. It was some space show. I forgot it. So I've had time in front of the camera. That's now... Great. To mention all the time in OVW. Yeah. I would, that was next, Prince. Good one. And OVW, Danny Davis tapes his shows like Raw. It's a one thing. They don't do, oh, cut, you messed up the line, and come back and do it again. Yeah. You, you, you did it. And if you effed up, Cornette was up your ass dancing on your kidney, and Danny was down your throat doing a jig on your stomach. I mean, you don't mess up. Now, tell me, King, did we ever mess up a promo? Oh, I messed up my first one because they forgot to turn the microphones on. That was in 1998. But as far as bowling services goes. Yeah, I, us. Oh, oh, I I screwed up a few, not talking about the content they wanted, but nothing that ever got scratched, nothing that the fans ever knew about. Because right. we knew how to get out of something, even if we got into something we weren't supposed to be into. And the thing is, with you two, you didn't really prepare because he's incapable of preparation. So you couldn't prepare for what he was no, going to do. No. You just no. Had so. And, and even when I worked against him with Rob Conway and stuff like that, I did my promos there. And then when I went with them, it was Kenny and I, and then Cena jumped in. Well, now you got promo heaven yeah. right yeah. there. You got promo heaven. And none of us were jealous, like you said. I'm glad and, you put that out. I was getting ready to say none of us. And you think if anyone would have been pissed, it would have been Cena because he, he was obviously the, uh, the granddaddy of promos and plus yeah. rookie on top of it. He didn't need us. No. Uh, uh, but it worked. Uh, but he sure as hell didn't need us. He would have been fine on his own. He was a professional. That's why, you know, he came in as I was the role model. He was my prototype. And you know how the people in Louisville are. If you, I mean, the biggest heat I got was when I said, here in Louisville, yeah. oh, man, they would go nuts. And, uh, Cena picked up on that. He did the same thing. Yeah. He yeah. Louisville. We I, worked off. So awesome. I'm telling you. Uh, like I said, I w and I wouldn't have got to go to Raw and get over on Ric Flair. That was Vince's way of saying thank you for a good job now, on the wedding. Now yeah. I'm a, now I'm a well-known atheist. What did I do with you before every match? Pray. Yeah. Oh, that got heat. I used to do the Rocky thing in the corner and pray, and Kenny would come over and act like he was praying with me. <laughs> that is a well-known atheist. I told him stand away a little bit. There could be a lightning bolt coming. <laughs> Yeah, stand back just a touch. Rico, I got a bit of a question for you because I've been kind of trying to point out that I've been around wrestling since I was born. I was yeah. Around, I was around the WWF from... You You were in a wrestling ring when you were six weeks old. I don't know if you yeah. know that. Uh, you I've remember heard... you, you beat uh, you beat Kurt Henning. I, I did. Well, everybody's getting Kurt Henning on the way out, you know. Put over the six <laughs> um, But what I was going to say is I was in the locker room a lot. I mean, you took me back rather by accident, but I was still back there very frequently. I don't ever recall Bruce Pritchard doing anything other than being a gopher. He would go get guys. He would move guys around. On his show, he takes credit for just about every angle, just oh about God. every match, just about every finish. And this isn't me taking cheap shots at him. I would say this even if he wasn't a mark for himself. But he wasn't a booker. He wasn't a writer. He was not an agent. He was a guy who said, hey, you got to go do this in five minutes. Hey, you got to go do this in ten minutes. Hey, can you go to this guy's office? He was a stooge. That's not negative against him. And I'm and I'm having you clarify this for me in case during your time he had a bigger role. Well, you even told me the other day when I informed you of all this, you said, Kenny, Bruce was never in the room when I did promos. It was always Stephanie. He and I never, ever worked together. I don't remember Bruce Pritchard doing anything with me. I don't. I could be mistaken. Okay, maybe he did a couple of promos and stuff. You know, I switched between Raw and SmackDown and a lot. Now, I talked to a friend the other day. He worked for WWE. He worked for the magazine. 
okay. as a matter of fact, and wrote articles. And he would be at both Raw and SmackDown. And I told him what you guys told me about Bruce saying he slapped me. Uh -huh. And he laughed. He, <laughs> says, a lot of he goes, oh, slap you, he said? I said, yeah. He said he had to slap me to get me flustered to do a spot. Uh, a promo. He yeah. goes, Bruce, he said, that. Bruce never slapped anybody. Now, this guy was always at the television shows. You know, uh, after you slapped me in the face and you jumped to hug me, yeah, that would be the worst thing you've done because then I'd have your genitals near my hand. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, he yeah, hugged yeah, yeah. You know, so you know, I don't remember a lot. I remember Bruce Pritchard, he would come in and out of Vince's office more times than I could count after the production meeting. He was always had a paper rolled up and he was always on to something. He had to be somewhere. He always had that hurried look on his face. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was, but he was always on a mission. I mean, yeah. the whole TV taping. And I'm not going to say he was a gopher or another, but he was always on a mission. That's how I'm going to put it. But well, Chris said he was a gopher. Yeah, he was well, yeah. But I'm just saying, Chris, you know, Chris sees it his way. I see it my way. Just right. he was always stressed. He always had that look in his eye, like, I got to get this done. I got to get this done. You well, know, it's like me rocking well, you know, yeah. when I rock in a chair. Yeah, the well, rocking, well yeah. that's why he loved coming to OBW so much is because he got to play agent, even though he would sit back in Danny's office, rock in a chair, to my knowledge, not tell anybody anything. He never did anything and, when he was a PNA. Yeah, he and, and he would uh, ask me how to do the Kroger meat scam because he was needing money for something. And there were Kroger's where he lived in Texas. And kept asking me how to do the, the Kroger meat scam, even though he makes fun of me for doing the Kroger meat scam. Allegedly, I may not have even done it. Maybe might, not. Might be a story for the book. Well, uh, that all was, I got to say I, is I did not dislike Bruce Pritchard. I didn't have any problem with him at all until he started claiming. Well, now they said he doesn't get six million downloads a week. They only get a million. They don't oh. get. Yeah, they, they get a million. Well, and, okay. Uh, um, it's know, like it's just like a stripper patting his jock. Yeah, it's it really is. So even though they got 40,000 followers on Twitter or whatever it is, there's Potato. 6 million or a million people, that'd be 4 million a month that tune into their show. And boy, that's that's a pretty good percentage of your 40,000 followers. Well, I I don't know how to get the numbers, but I know you do, King, so you know, that that's out of my league. Like well, I said, this is my first and, podcast. And, and people get on me about bragging about having a billion downloads over 13 years and and what people don't understand is not only do I have I done countless of my own shows and countless of Cornette shows, Russo shows, various other, and all of these other and let's call them what they are up and comers. I, I rarely for a long time said no to anybody because uh, I wanted to elevate their shows, much like what wrestlers and wrestling personalities do. We we pass the baton, mm -hmm. try to elevate the other guy. And, yeah. Um, but Russo will tell you that I've got 1 billion certified downloads. He better if he ever shows up on this show. <laughs> well, maybe, he, maybe he'll be 1 billion and 1. Maybe. Uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe. If he'll download the show that we do together. Yeah. You got any questions on this, Jeff? On on the Bruce thing? Well, like, like what, what do you remember from, if anything, from that night? Because I'm sure that, I mean, that was a big storyline. It was a big deal. You know, do you remember this particular promo with the, um, with the wedding planner, the phone call? No, uh, I know. I, I, but I take that back. I remember having to be on the phone. I think I was running to Stephanie's office. I think that was it telling her about something. I was trying to convince her to come to the wedding because she was trying to back out. Oh, but oh, at the end, like Russo. Oh, back, ooh, back I, 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 listen, I haven't even met the guy yet. So <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm going to wait till I meet him before I say anything. <laughs> that podcast one spot. You got to uh, Yeah, I guess. I guess. <laughs> you know. So, but I do remember that backstage segment and the whole thing what, you know, in the end you found out was to get Stephanie out there so Eric can confront her. 3 minute warning takes care of Billy and Chuck and I am off to Raw with Bischoff, you Ooh. know. Who would have produced that segment just for history's sake? Who who normally produced you? Mostly it was Stephanie. And if that was, I remember. If she was in the segment with you, she would have produced it. It wouldn't have been oh, somebody else. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I, like I said, I never paid attention. They handed me, like I said, very few vignettes in the back. I didn't have that many. Well, here, here's um, the other thing you pointed out to me. You were talking about how um, very, very few people knew that that angle was going down and that Bischoff nobody. was a man. You told me Pritchard 
wasn't even in on it. They didn't even let him in on it. He didn't know. So how would he be producing a bit that he knows nothing about? Kayfabe to everybody. Like I said, Vince brought Eric to the arena in his limo, made up already, yeah. catered to Eric all day in the lunchroom. When it was catered, he brought this preacher or this minister his lunch, took him back to the back, walked around with them. Nobody knew stuff except yeah. Jamal, Rosie, Billy, I, Stephanie, Eric, of course. When, when, Clayton, uh, when Clayton Moore put on a mask, I had no idea that it was the Long Ranger. My Maybe. dad, my dad. <laughs> this is late in California, my younger years. Le Clayton Moore and the guy from, uh, oh my God, Rockford Files were uh, James Garner. James Garner. And my, okay, we're, they're in a golf club, you know, golf, golf course, golf club. And I guess some people walked up and my dad says, do you know who this is? This is, this is the Lone Ranger. And Clayton Moore went like this. You shouldn't have done that, Sal. <laughs> <laughs> I, just blew, I just blew the microphones out. I've actually got a great Clayton Moore story that Cornette tells, and I might screw it up a little bit, but I think I'm pretty close. They were apparently in North Carolina getting ready to do an appearance at a car dealership. And it was Cornette and uh, someone else. And the Long Ranger was going to be appearing with him. And that was back when they were giving him grief and they wouldn't let him wear his mask. So he had to wear oh. the big black glasses. Do you remember that? So oh, he's back the car and, they're in, and they're in a minor car accident. And so they're out and they're, they're trying to handle this car accident. And they're just taking up time. They're late for this appearance. Clayton Moore's in the back with those glasses on in his Long Ranger outfit. And he's got those big glasses on and all this chaos and controversy on Clayton Moore gets out of the back seat of the car with those glasses on his cowboy hat and his boots and everything gets out in the middle of the traffic walks up to the cops officers is there anything I can do to help you here <laughs> and the officers are so put over by this that they immediately put Cornette and the Long Ranger and whoever else was with them into a police car and drove them to the dance <laughs> and they didn't even have to deal with it they just left the driver there to handle all this yeah. and I put the Long Ranger and Cornette and whoever was with him do <laughs> An appearance at a cornet and, and Tonto. <laughs> <laughs> it may have been Tonto. I hope it was. I guess he did. The Lone Ranger go, Hi ho, Silver, in the cop car. <laughs> I don't know that he did. I, I didn't get that part of it. But they okay, let me get back to the Jeff. Lone Ranger. Gets yeah. out. I guess there anything I can do that. Oh. Yeah. He was a hero back then. You okay, what? Jeff, you got any questions? You want to know, like, okay, when one guy's telling one side of a story and then the other guy saying something completely different. I, I'm just always curious is how, how do we get to this point? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. How can it be two, two totally different uh, recollections well, of the same one event? Is, one is a known liar and the other one is not. Well, I'm not on a podcast and I don't have to get downloads and I don't have to explain myself. There's a Wikipedia page on me that explains my whole life. And I didn't even participate in this. It's 98% accurate. I wasn't part of Metro Police Department SWAT. I was part of North Las Vegas. I was a North Las Vegas police officer. So other than that, it has my real name, where I'm from, military school, movies I've been into, championships I've won, appearances, everything. Now, I looked under Bruce Pritchard's name to see what he did. <laughs> and all he did was uh, Bruce Pritchard, uh, brother, brother Love, which is what he ripped off from Steve Martin from the movie Leap of Faith. Yeah. Okay, so he did the brother love thing. I didn't like it, the character, but because all these yelled, yell, 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 yell. That was my ultimate warrior was my hero. So you take his career and you take my career. Okay, I'm a has been. Okay, I, I've done a lot of things and I've done everything I'm doing in my life. Bruce Pritchard is a never was. You know, uh, I'm sorry, Bruce. Uh, if you feel like you're a man that you need to say you've done something to me or diminish me for any reason on your show i still have the same phone number i had in wwe if you're willing to talk about this call me and we'll talk about this all right uh that's all i can say you want to work it out like a man or you want to do this he said she said you know mr pritchard uh, well i can't call you mr pritchard because there's only one mr pritchard and that's dr tom that man has a lot of class. Yeah, right? he's Mr. Hey, uh, maybe I should just say, uh, Bruce, why don't you <laughs> call me? I can go there. But seriously. And if you need the or if you don't have it, we will be happy to supply that to you, Bruce. Yeah, call me, Bruce. And then maybe refresh my memory 
on yeah. when you allegedly slapped me or a phone or I couldn't get a promo right or get flustered. Are you kidding? I can get flustered like that for shoot. <laughs> yeah, I'm I said, so I don't need to act. I could just do myself. Yeah. Rico, I, okay. have, a, I have a non-wrestling question for you. Yeah. What is the scary situation you were in in all your years of police work? What's the worst thing that you remember encountering? If you tell me you don't want to talk about, that's fine. I'm just okay. Kidding. Well, I, I could talk about this one. Okay. Um, in North Las Vegas, a couple of gangs. There's the Crips and the Bloods. They live on two different sides of the of the section. And you know, you can't go up to somebody who's dealing drugs, making five hundred to thousand dollars a day. Tell him to stop do doing drugs and go get a job at McDonald's. And at that time, in '85. You know, it's three thirty-five an hour, three fifty an hour, and he's supporting his family, his brothers and sisters. How can you tell somebody to do that? Yeah, you're not going to change them. So, you know, you're a community officer. You're supposed to protect the bad guys as well as the good guys. Okay, you're supposed to be neutral. Now, me, I had, I had simple rules for the drug dealers. Don't do it in front of me. Don't, don't force yourself on people. You know, stop their cars and ask if they want drugs. And if you get ripped off on a drug deal, treat it like a business. High, low, or high, higher your prices on the next deal and make it up. Don't go shooting up my neighborhoods, killing yeah. the innocent people. And I said, listen, I travel this line. And when I travel this line, you travel this line. When your line crosses my line, we're going to talk. Now, it could be the easy way or the hard way. And if I can't get it done, there's 15 other officers at the end of this Motorola that are going to come help me. Yeah. So, you know, so I, you know, in the neighborhoods, how I got my intel is walking the neighborhoods and talking to the people. I would talk to the grandmamas. I'd go up there and say, Grandma, what's going on in the neighborhood? Oh, let me tell you, Rico. And they didn't call me Rico. My nickname in the police department was Rambo. <laughs> they <laughs> gave me that number. And I can okay. see you doing this too. I, yeah. I Here I am, 23 as a cop. Oh my and I'm God. 218 pounds with a 32 inch waist. And so I right. would go in the neighborhoods and talk to people. You know, I'd see the gang members. And when I'd go through the neighborhoods, I'd, what I said the rules were, I had uh, a little uh, stair, a little box, you know, a carry AM, FM radio with a cassette. I used to play Motley Crue over the police speaker so they would hear me coming <laughs> and, they, and they put the dope away. They get away from the vacant houses and that'd be cool. Well, a lot of those people like to run. And one day I got lured into a trap basically because there's vacant houses and they board them up on the outside with plywood. Right. So one end of the, the street is metros and the other side is ours. Gerson park was uh, the, the project area and that part sorry, was the sheriff's sheriff's uh, jurisdiction. And on the other side of Comstock was our jurisdiction. So I went up in a police car and I'm in full uniform. The guy's selling dime bags and uh, I stopped my car. I say, stop. He stakes running. So as we're running, we're going over cinder block walls, chain link fences, and I'm trying to call it in where I am. Well, I get the area, but then we go over and he runs into a vacant house. And it's boarded up. So I go in there and there's there's five people waiting for me mm. with two by fours and stuff like that. I went help and they hit somebody hit me in the back with a two by four. Well, my back's my most muscular part of my body, and I didn't wear a vest. So right, if a I'm fight hit, that's where I hope I even get hit at. Yeah. No. Yeah. So a fight starts. Yeah. And I'm just swinging, kicking, punching, doing everything I can. And I hear radio, and thank God for this dispatcher. Her name was Patricia. She had ice for blood. I mean, she, I heard her talking, and she got these officers to the area I was in. Mm -hmm. I heard the sirens, but I was fighting. Yeah. So the last guy I got, I picked him up over my head, and I threw him through the front door. And he <laughs> went out through the plywood, and then the officer's name was Ed DeBrutz, goes, found him. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then I, but I was in the zone where I just blanked out and I and I still went after this guy. It took those officers to pull me off because I was past dark mode. I was in yeah. you're not gonna breathe no more mode. And ladies and gentlemen, that guy, that little drug dealer, 
was known as Bruce Pritchard. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Actually, the guy who I was chasing was sitting in the back room, didn't want to fight or else it'd have been six. He <laughs> sat there, they went and arrested him afterwards. I, I don't blame him. I'd sit in the back yeah. room too. So that's one story. Another story, real quick, is there was one guy. His name was O'Neill. And nobody could catch him. He would sit in the, at this big tree in the middle of a park. And he would sit under that tree and sell his drugs. Because you couldn't, I mean, cops couldn't get in fast enough because he would take the rocks and just throw them down on the ground. And we'd have nothing. Yeah. So I'm sitting there one day and, and his brother is a state senator. Damn. Okay. So... I'm thinking, how am I going to catch this guy? So I go into my Rico ADD mode. So I go to Radio Shack, and I buy an earpiece, and I plug it in my walkie-talkie. I park my car around a corner. I walk to the park, and I climb in the tree. Oh, my God. And I'm sitting oh in the tree, and I'm waiting for him. And I'm <laughs> looking down, and this guy comes up, and he's by the tree. He's got a rock. A guy comes over. I see the drugs change hands, the money change hands, and I yell, freeze, and they both went like this. <laughs> and, and out of the tree I came, Badoop, right on top of them. And the, the guy who bought the drugs started running. I said, I'm not after you. Don't worry about it. I'll catch you later. And I got this guy. So by the time I got finished booking him, and then I booked the evidence, and then I walked to go write my report. He was already getting out of jail. State Senator. Senator yeah. yeah. There you go. And then I got called in the sergeant's office. Oh, you're kidding me. Nope. <laughs> nope. I thought it was quite inventive myself. Oh, well, <laughs> native, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't have thought of it. But what did they do? Say it was entrapment or entreatment? Entreatment. <laughs> no, but he just had to do stuff like that. You know, but on the other side, you know, it wasn't nothing for me to go to the junior high school, take off my gun belt, and play basketball with the kids on my lunch break. It's yeah, just yeah. be a community officer, you know, protect and serve. Can't do that now because they'll pick up the gun and shoot you. Mm, actually, I had a great – those drug dealers and gang members could have killed me anytime they wanted. Anytime. Actually, they could have. This is actually a good question for you because I've read a lot about the deterioration of police relationships in America. And they say that a lot of it, if you go back to the 40s, 50s, even the 60s into the 70s before the crack epidemic and before the war on drugs from Reagan, that there were more community officers. There's more people like you who had the relationships in these neighborhoods and it was safer and it was easier to protect and easier to patrol. And then yeah. the drugs came, people were so concerned with busts and with catching these people that they alienated the entire neighborhood. They're taking away fathers, brothers, sons that it kind of led to the situation we're in now to where it has become so dangerous just to be a police officer in these neighborhoods. Yeah, sometimes. I remember uh, the street was called Ingolstadt and Rico. as <laughs> R-E-C-C-O. Not yeah. me, but it was Ingolstadt and Rico. And I was just around the corner, and a call came out for shots fired. And I got there. I was about less than a minute away. Came around, and there was a guy on the ground who was shot. Now, I arrested this guy several times for doing drugs, and I, I held him, and uh, I got there so quick I passed the gunman Damn! in my car, and I was holding this guy in my arms, and he got shot on one side. The 22 went through the other side, so it, nicked, it went through his lungs and nicked his heart. I didn't know that at the time, yeah. so I'm sitting there talking to this guy, and he's telling me, Rambo, I'm scared. Rambo, I'm scared. I said, it's okay. And I cuddled him in my arms, tell him everything's all right. You're going to be okay. And he died in my arms. Oh. And then I talked to his parents and I said, your son is going to get shot if he doesn't turn himself in. Yeah. I yeah. said, you know, other gang members are going to come after him and he's in trouble. Get a lawyer and turn himself in. And the kid turned himself in the next day to the next jurisdiction. Wow. That's yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of stories like that, you know, just, just try to be there and, you know, be impartial. Yeah. Be, part of, be part of the neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. Well, just, just, just be a, see, when I took the job as an officer, I took a step down. I'm now a second class citizen because I'm supposed to protect yeah. first class citizens. And it doesn't matter if I arrested you and you came back the next week, I talked to you like you're my friend. Yeah. I don't hold, you know, I didn't go on criminal records. You know, I, I spoke to everybody. You, you were, know, you were Tony Beretta. You were a man of the people. Uh, oh, no, I didn't have a bird. 
They'd have loved you. Gotta have it. Gotta have a bird. Yeah. Frank. Yeah. But that's how I took law enforcement. And I was on, let's see, I was North Las Vegas when I was a kid. When I was with the power team, I was appointed by the sheriff of Conway, Arkansas, which is in Faulkner County, Bob Blankenship, as a special investigator. So when I was off, I would go to that, fly to Arkansas and do burglary wow. stakeouts because nobody knew me in Conway. Then I was a state investigator for the state of Nevada and part-time U.S. Marshal. Worked at the, at the Marshal's office. And that doesn't count process serving. I had my own private investigating business in Florida. You know, so you know, I've got to do a lot of things. God has been very good to me. Sorry, Kenny. But he's, so what, he's, what are you up to these days, Rico? Like, what what are you doing now? Uh, you watch The Walking Dead? Yeah, oh, watch I've, I watched all seven seasons yeah. in three days. <laughs> seven seasons of what? The Walking, Walking Dead. Dead. Oh, yeah. yeah. I haven't, uh, I kind of lost interest in that about season five. Well, it's time to get back it. picks in back it. up. It does. Yeah. Oh, it picks back up later on. I, I, I couldn't start calling this stuff until about season three. And then Negan shows up. The last episode is season six. Yeah. And then he just, wow. He just wreaks havoc on season seven. And then it throws a curve around there, but I'm not going to say nothing. Now, did you solely get interested in, in Walking Dead because of me and, and another yeah. guy? Podcast yeah, called Stone Cold Steve Austin, who Who's actually that? goes up to do my shows. Uh, man, that Rico is very much indebted to, by the way. We talk, oh, about yeah, show. and uh, yeah, Rico uh, uh, Stone Cold actually shows up for these podcast one shows when I do them, so that's very nice of him. Rico, the yeah. next you got to try out, you can use our Amazon password to watch. Oh, it. yeah, it's called Justified. Have you ever heard of that one? No, not yet. Timothy Oliphant, do you know who yeah, he is? It's uh, it's about a year oh, yeah, yeah. Oliphant was the hitman, the first one, and yeah. he played uh, uh, the sheriff in Dead uh, Deadwood. Yeah, oh, Dead Bullock. I didn't, I didn't know he's that. He's a he's a U.S. Marshal yeah. in uh, Lexington. Yeah, in the Lexington, in, in, Kentucky. Like, yeah, in the show, and it is a fantastic show. And it is shot pretty much as a shoot as, yeah, as it's to a how gr drug dealing goes uh, on. And, and I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll get on Facebook tonight and I'll send you our Amazon information so you can watch it. All right. You, you as a well, no, no, I got the fire stick. Just tell me justified and I'll Yeah, yeah. You yeah, as a I got it. might like justified even better than you like Walking Dead. It I okay. overall a better oh, show. Oh, it's it's sweet, man. It's, and you don't you don't and there's a there's a heel in there you you will eventually fall in love with. He's yeah. such a great character. And United oh, Federal yeah. Raylan Givens is his name. United States okay. Federal Marshal. US Federal yeah. Maya was telling oh. me today, speaking of Negan, that Vince Russo has a passing resemblance to Negan. No. He gets oh, that. Oh. He gets that a lot. Yeah. Weird in the hair. Oh, Negan. Yeah. Speaking about Negan, do you uh, know what else he did? What else? He was Thomas Wayne yeah. in Batman versus Superman. Oh. Yeah. And he was Edward Blake in The Watchmen. Yeah. I didn't know I that. Was, I was telling someone that he's uh he's really wanting to play. Have you seen Thomas Wayne, the violent, crazy Batman? No, I haven't seen that yet. I it's, played the I played uh my, uh, Michael Keaton Batman. That's the Batman I played. There's a there's an alternate timeline in DC called Flashpoint to where Bruce Wayne is killed as a kid and his parents, Thomas becomes uh, Batman and he's roided out. He's crazy. He carries two Mac-10s and he just guns everybody down. And oh, his Brock Lesnar. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Brock Lesnar with two Mac-10s and a Batman suit. <laughs> oh, yeah. God, that's all we need. Yeah. <laughs> Good Lord. Brock, you're not on any gas. I don't know what that D-ball was doing in your car, but I'm sure you weren't taking it. I'm absolutely <laughs> Brock, sure. I tell you what, you know, I worked with him and stuff, but he is one strong man. Uh, are you, <laughs> are you man. He, he couldn't whip me, though. <laughs> when he debuted, he put, he put Mark Henry up on his shoulders for the F5, and Dad called Mark went, man, you made him look great. Man, yeah. I, you jump like that, Mark went, motherfucker. I didn't jump at all. <laughs> no, but Brock is a strong guy. I remember in our dark matches, he threw me from one corner. I bounced in the center and landed in the other. Yeah, just a mutant. Uh, yeah. He is that. If Hitler had a wet dream, it was Brock Lesnar. <laughs> oh, yeah. There was I got to see him a couple times in Vegas. He came through. What was Hitler doing in Vegas? I thought he was an Hitler. Hitler. I thought he was, too. <laughs> Brock. Oh, Brock. I thought Hitler was in Vegas. Man, I thought he was down in South yeah, America. That, 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 that town of change of <laughs> he shows up. <laughs> Won't be so many shows. <laughs> um <laughs> them going to cancel. Yeah. Listen to real quick, real quick. Robin Williams did a skit. He went over to Germany and was interviewed. Oh, and okay. the, the, the person says, 
uh, why do you think Germany doesn't have that many funny people? And Robin looked right at the and says, don't you think you might have killed them all? <laughs> and the lady, it, it went right over her head. She continued oh, with the interview. Oh, oh, my God. It was funny. when I, I lived in Germany for a little while. And when I was over there, everybody's really small, especially in the east. It's it, just tiny people. In the south, they get bigger. They're more like Americans. But, you know, in even the northwest and in the east, tiny, tiny people. Hmm. And I, I felt like a giant over there. Like, I was walking around like Kevin Nash in the city I was in. Like, I'd step over shit. Just big man and everybody. <laughs> Six one. Um, it's six one two sixty. So, oh, oh, by the way, there there was a little scuffle that broke out on one of the trains once, or the buses, or whatever he was riding. And Chris pulls out his passport. Calm down, everybody. I'm an American. I got this. I did that. I did that constantly. <laughs> I'm an American. I got this. Yeah, that that was more than just on trains. I did that all the time. If I wanted to pet somebody's dog, I'd pull out my passport. I'm an American. They, they don't let you pet their dogs. They get really pissy about it. Yeah. So I would pull out. Wow. My, no, it's fine. I'm American, and I just play with their dog. <laughs> Oh, we there were, ain't been a dog yet. We we were. Uh, they still recycle bottles. They do the deposit for bottles. So we went to the grocery right. store, and this woman's just a bitch. And Maya can't figure out where to put the bottles. I've been there like two weeks. I speak no German. I don't know anything that's going on. And they're having this fight, and I hear them. And this girl starts like pointing a finger at Maya's face. So I pull out my passport. I look up to her, and I go, "I am from the United Damn States of America." And she took all <laughs> my, took all my bottles personally and put them back there. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, it, as soon as you start showing them hostility and belligerence in an American way, I had a kid. This kid was like 10. He walks up to me on the train, like gets in my face and goes, I hate Manchester United. I hope you whipped his ass. I looked at oh him I got God. Back in face and went, I don't give a shit. I'm not British. <laughs> you British, they, huh? No, this town was so out of the way. Like it was a biggish city, but it was not anywhere for tourists. It was just. Tarunja, it's just this area. So no yeah. So I was the only one there speaking English all the time. When I got there, I was the only native English speaker in the city, the only one. Wow. That's why I got the job I got. Yeah. So yeah. no one spoke English except me and Maya. So they all thought I was American. Or they all thought that I was just whatever, British or whatever. So this kid tried to guess where I was from. He said, Are you Welsh? No. Are you British? I said, No one's from Wales, first of all. No one. No one's Simon, from Wales. Simon. Simon's from Wales. Yeah, Simon and uh, the, Mar the guy that designed my Wade, Marvel comics. Wade team. Barrett's from Wales, too. But yeah, it's like, no Shout one's out from... to Simon. Shout out to Wade Barrett. Uh, no one's Why from not? Wales. OBW boy. So, uh, and they guessed, and they never got to America. It was so far fetched that America would go to their town. But yeah, I'd pull out my passport like a police badge. Chris Bowen, USA, what's going on around here? Wow. <laughs> Just. I did something bold like that when I was bodyguarding for a family in Florida. Um, uh, the daughter had a boyfriend who went to Oxford. Okay. And she went over to Oxford and we were, I got to be in Oxford <laughs> as a student. I was undercover, but, uh, you know, when my, it was 12 hour shifts. So when I was done, I liked rugby and okay. my, my team for rugby was the all blacks, all New Black. Zealand. Yeah. Right. So I go into this. That sounds English. racist. No, all nope. black. That's new. It's not racist. Okay. All aboriginals. Oh. So I go into the all white. They're the all white. Yeah. I'm wearing this jersey, an all black jersey, was black and white with the silver fern on it. Yeah. And it just so happens that the New Zealand team is taking on the English team, and the English team is getting stomped. And every yeah. time they scored a try, I was like, "Yeah," because <laughs> I like I like the haka. I like yeah. that dance they do yeah, before. The, yeah, oh, they do uh, the haka. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And I've been there. And Chris, the Macarena? No, 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 not the, no. This dance is meant to scare you. Yeah, it's just oh, a tribal. Oh. I want to see yeah, that. It's tribal. Yeah, I love I pull it up on the internet. But yeah, they, they didn't they didn't come near me. But they I know they're looking at me going bloody American. Yeah. You know? The weirdest things in Germany. The city that I lived in had a Division three soccer soccer team, like beyond nothing, like division. Three. Single A, single A baseball equivalency. Just they didn't mean dick. And the people of this town would riot every Saturday. In my apartment, <laughs> overlooked the football stadium. I could watch the game from my window. So one day I'm in the coffee shop. They're not even Double A Chattanooga. No, the, this is legitimately a single A team. They mean nothing. So they're called Erfurt Rotweiss. If anybody wants to Google them, I assure Russian. you, uh, German Rotweiss, uh, red and white. So. Um, I'm in the train station, and there's also like a Division Three hockey team called the Erfurt Black Dragons, who again don't mean a damn thing. I would root for them. Yeah, they had a cool logo. Like, like, they had like a really cool logo. So go Black Dragons. So I'm in the uh, I'm in the Hauptbahnhof, the train, the main train station of the city, and I'm at a coffee shop, you know, using Wi-Fi, downloading my stuff. 
and I'm talking to him on Facebook. Or not on Facebook, but on uh, FaceTime. And FaceTime. he starts hearing this yelling outside. He's like, what the hell is that? I said, I don't know, these soccer hooligans. Let me go look. So I go out, and I look to my left, and there's all the local soccer fans just screaming and pointing and making all these, like, they're flipping people off, just going crazy. I look to my right, and it's all the hockey hooligans going back and forth at him. And they're getting into a fight over whose team is more non... Not over. Yeah, over whose team is more irrelevant. It's like, <laughs> man, the stuff you see in Eastern Germany. Oh, Lord. Uh, well, different countries. I'm, can you imagine? Yeah. Can you imagine I've Ryan? been around the globe three times. Yeah, exactly. Can, yeah, you you've can, seen some. Can you weird... imagine riots at a at a at a Chattanooga lookout baseball game? Just, and it was every weekend. I'd come outside of my apartment. Car windows are broken. Garbage cans are on fire. Graffiti everywhere. Wow. Trash all over the streets. I'd come back out Sunday morning. Beautiful, perfect, ideal little town. It's like, man, they clean up quicker on here. No, they no. Must. One other thing I want to cover that Bruce Pritchard had said on a previous show. Apparently, I got mentioned on their show like six, seven, eight weeks in a row. But a lot of people were doing that because for whatever reason, little old me, if you mention my name, apparently it gets attention and controversy going on your podcast. So Lawler mentions me every week. Uh, Pritchard does. Cornette did. I mean, I was on everybody's show there for quite some time. Uh, Russo would mention me, but in a kind way. And uh, but, one of the, the one, but one of the things. Yeah, yeah, not anymore. <laughs> Yeah. I think I think it. <laughs> but, but, but one thing Pritchard said, and and you just speak from the heart. We have not pre-discussed this. You speak from the heart, and you tell people whatever you feel. I may have had to contribute in either in any small way or if at all. But Pritchard said, "Yeah," he says, "I don't know why Bolin gets all his credit for his Bolin services stuff." And I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically said Kenny Bolin didn't have crap to do. With the development of any of his wrestlers, Bolin showed up, did what he was told, and went home. You never and, did what you were told. Well, I certainly never did that. Well, there's the first right there. Uh, you never did what you were told. What I was told, no. It whatever came to mind. Well, a lot of that. Me personally speaking, I was the first WWE or WWF developmental to show up in, in Ohio Valley. In fact, my first night, I wrestled the Louisville Gardens with the Andretti brothers. And this is me only. Uh, eight months in the business, wrestled 12 matches, and now I'm in the Louisville Gardens? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my gosh. So... Now, the first one that was assigned to me was uh, Bull Buchanan from WWE. Right. I was, I was busy being a baby face. Yeah, well, okay. That's, at the same time, that's yeah. right. Okay, you're right. You're right. Yeah. I was I a baby forgot, face. I forgot you. It's hard for me to, to look at you and realize that you weren't with me from the beginning. It feels like no. it was you from day one, but you're right. That took a while. Yeah, I was, well, as you said, and Jimmy said, that top baby face, top you know, baby. American gladiator thing, uh, me and Dismore, you know, had with, with Flash and I tagged with Trailer Park, you yeah. know, we'd do a hardcore match and stuff. And that was going until I was wrestling Dinsmore for the title. And remember, I used to be a hip toss and I used to do a full flip. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, the ring, remember the ring, the old ring had a big dip in it. Oh my God, do I remember. Tore I, my I, left I, I, quad. Trust. Yeah, tore my left quad in the middle of match. I, I couldn't like get up. Anything. Yeah, I couldn't get up. So, uh, or I was wrestling Flash and Dinsmore. Okay, I, I was wrestling Flash. I think it was Flash. Yeah, I think it was Flash. Yeah, was Flash. And then Dinsmore had to come out and take over the match for me. And then I had to have surgery on my leg. I was out four months, five months, something like that. Right about it. you came back way quicker than anybody said you would. Yeah, because uh, they were doing therapy. I mean, Vince yeah. paid for it, which I I'm appreciated of. He didn't have to. I was under developmental. He could told me eat dirt, go away, but he <laughs> paid for my flight home, paid for the surgery, paid for the physical therapy, and took care, and still paid me my my salary. So Vince was cool with that. And so when I came back, Kenny and I were talking, and Kenny wanted to bring me back as a heel. Well, Cornet crapped on it. Danny crapped on it. He's our top baby face. He ain't gonna make a heel. Da 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 da. And it won't work. Ain't got a chance in hell. Ain't got a chance. So Kenny, if I'm not mistaken, you said give me six weeks with them. Six weeks. Is six weeks. Thinking. And if it doesn't work, you can have them back. Uh -huh. Well, you know, when I was a baby face, when I first got there, he took me to Kingfish on a, on the Indiana side. And Kenny said he would help promote me. So I gave him a bunch of eight by tens and stuff like that. Well, he opened a, the trunk of his Cadillac and there were my pictures scattered all over his trunk. For the record, oh. Rico used to not like me very much. Well, right then I was mad. I was like, you Very said you're going to promote me, and this is this, and this is that, this is that. Well, I let him talk. 
<laughs> and he goes, this is my office. This is where I do my business. This is how I do it. And yeah. I went, I went, all right, I'll give the man a chance. And then he started doing what he said. You know, he was doing it, but I was a new guy and I was anxious to do things. Rico assumed oh. I just dumped him in the trunk and was yeah. out and I wasn't doing shit for him. And, yeah. and uh, I still to this day do 80% of my business out of the trunk. If you car. saw his trunk, it, you couldn't fit a body in there. This is a big Cadillac. Yeah, I tried. You couldn't get a midget in there. No, no. You, would, you wouldn't be working with any Italians. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so but like I said, Kenny would promote me, but when I was a face, we couldn't really be there together. Uh, only time we were there and together is LaGrange at that softball. Mm -hmm. Remember that, Kenny? Uh, you were you were the heel, yep. and I was the face, and they said no home runs. And believe it or not, folks, back then, Kenny was about, what, three and a quarter? Right about, yeah, about three and a quarter. Yeah. Still a pretty good athlete at that weight, though. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I did. I wasn't fool enough, foolish enough to play him in basketball. Other people were. But I will tell you, Kenny was and solid. What, and what happened to each and every one of those that played me in basketball? Got whooped. Everyone got whooped. I, I, Jericho didn't play me because he knew better. I have apologized yeah. to Linda Miles for numerous things on this show, and that's just one more. I have to say, I'm sorry, Linda. You didn't deserve that. <laughs> you didn't deserve it. Oh, but Kenny, Kenny was solid. He wasn't. Like, you know, he's low. He was solid. I know I had to go against him a couple of times with yeah, the yeah, briefcase yeah. and hit him. Kenny was solid. Fell on you. Fell so, on you. Yeah, don't do that. I remember we did that. That's how, that's how I said the WWE, I had to fall on you. So you <laughs> earned that trip. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't wait to get out. I almost squirted out. <laughs> yeah, I got knocked out and I fell on top of Rico for the one, two, three. So yeah. I'm one and over. Yeah. Bad. Yeah, you did. He, he needs to tough. Yeah. So we go to this softball game. They tell them no home runs. So Kenny gets up for the heel side, and these I, are challenged I didn't, kids. I didn't, hear that rule. I didn't hear that rule. Oh, these are challenged kids. You know, they're they're they're. I don't know if you can say the word handicap, but they're handicapped a little bit. But they're playing ball. So Kenny gets up and he hits this line drive Screaming towards the second. It, I mean, it was on fire, <laughs> and this little kid it went by his head. The kid didn't even see it. If this would have connected with that kid's head. It came off. They, they measure bat and ball speed these days. They didn't do it back then. But if they'd have measured the bats, the ball speed off that bat, it had to have been over 100 miles an hour. It, oh, my God. Yeah, it, it kind of reminded me of the balls that came out of the American Gladiator when they were shooting the tennis oh, balls. Yeah. Those, those came out at 100 miles. I bet they, uh, did you ever get hit by one of those? I mean, I, they looked like they'd hurt. Yeah, like I was hit, but not real hit. You glanced. Yeah. And, you know, I never won that event, and I liked that one the best. But I never lost joust. So, but, but, that, that well, back to that poor kid. They called me yeah. out because you yeah. weren't to hit 100 mile an hour screaming line drives. You weren't allowed to hit over. So, yeah. the same time up, I hit one about 150 feet beyond the fence because, well, number one, the fence was short. Number two, yeah. up, there were these little punks that I could hit a ball real far. You did. Rico, Rico had their back. I'm sure everybody was real impressed. There. Well, as, as I took the slow tour around the bases with the one flap down, I learned that from Jeffrey Leonard. You yeah, flap down and tour the bases, and, and uh, then at the end of the game, they said, "Well, wait. Kenny, Kenny hit one, Rico popped one, so I hit one. I don't think it's landed yet, but <laughs> I hit one. I struck <laughs> you out. What are you talking about? I've struck you out on three pitches in softball. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was it was for the kids. <laughs> and then once I became part of Bowling Services, uh, we got to go out together, and we uh -huh. did." Everything we could. Back to that ball game. Do you remember when the oh. school teacher got hot at me and come up into the broadcast, the announcer's booth? Uh, the, she got mad at me because my job as heel was to cut a promo on the kids. Yeah. Up into the dugout, I said, hey, you bunch of little losers. Look, you just choked that game away, you little creeps. Oh. So I'm getting all over oh, these that's kids. that's tasteless. And your job is to come and save the baby faces. Well, before you could get there to save the little little leaguers for me cutting a promo on them, Karen yeah. Krieger comes up in that booth. Somebody I graduated high school with, she's cutting a promo on me. She's calling me every name in the book. How dare you say that to these little kids? You've destroyed these little guys. They look up to you all, and you're out here calling them little creepy. There's kids out there crying. And I'm well, back there in, in, in a standby position. I wasn't worried about them crying. Rico was going to come in and save the day and bitch slap yeah. me little foot, throw me in the limo and get me out of it. Well, we didn't get to do that. No, this lady took over. <laughs> Aaron Krieger took over and just went off on me. And I, I she had to get her shit in. She got her she shit She did. But yeah, yeah. I, went, 
that booth uh, what uh, 20 feet in the air where they call the games and introduce the little kids from so i took the mic they had no idea i was gonna do it <laughs> look at look at that team y'all suck <laughs> calling them names and little creeps and and then the thing was rico and i didn't clue rico on it either but he knew his job was to come in and save these little kids well he didn't get to didn't so the, get my, my old high school buddy come up and ripped me a new ass. Yeah, if you knew something terrible, I think Rico knew to cover. Oh, I course, think that was just the course. that was just the nature of the friendship there. Yeah, Rico. Yeah. I, guess, I guess we have to tell him about the the kiss, the hundred dollar kiss. Oh, the uh, the kingfish. Oh, the kingfish. The kingfish. kingfish. Yeah. Well, we went there and Toe Clipper was with us, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, Butch oh. Razor, old biscuits, biscuits and, and gravy. There's there's been another fall. Out yeah, we don't speak to him anymore. Again, oh, again. Okay. Give it a year. Well, to bring people up. Uh, his brother, Timmy John, I was at Kenny's house. We were discussing stuff. And Timmy John just took off his socks and his shoes, put his stinky ass feet on the table, and started clipping his toenails on the coffee table. And just to cover the type of feet that Timmy John had, he was a professional power washer at the time. So the uh, man basically had trench foot at all like times. Brick washer. Yeah, it's not brick put washer, power yeah. with anything related yeah, yeah. to Yeah, he was a brick washer. So he'd stand like, with a power washer. He'd stand calf deep in mud all day. That did, you, did, did you use the word professional with Timmy John? Well, he, he got paid sometimes. Yeah, somebody. He somebody gambled away. Yeah. But he, and he but, was just yeah. the worst I've ever, ever they gave been him around. They gave him a loan to take to the casinos. Yeah, I just I just went off on him. I did the the same promo Kenny did on the kids. I did on Timmy John. So <laughs> in the room, and there's such this uh, big yard ape sitting there in the damn living room clipping his toenails. This big baboon, so and you can hear him snap. I was like, yeah. click, and they go flying. And he doesn't, <laughs> click, he doesn't and they go flying. He doesn't see a problem with this. He thinks this uh, is okay. And yeah. Rico coming over, we were all going to dinner, and Rico went off on this big buffoon. Called him yeah. every book and told him if he ever saw him do anything like I that. I vividly again, remember him saying, up. have you no cooth? <laughs> yeah. No. Timmy, well, and then when Timmy John looked up and saw what cooth meant, he was really hurt. Yeah. Yeah, that was too big of a word. All right, he I didn't like, look it up. I we, remember we that like I him. remember my own name. We, we, he didn't look it up. We did it for him. Yeah. So we go to Kingfish. Yeah. And we... we Timmy John's birthday. Yeah. Which is and, this happened. Oh, okay. the, the promo got kicked. Okay, when he wouldn't cut his toenails on his birthday. Asked so to... yeah, we we still you know he didn't finish, but he put his socks and shoe back on. So we get there and we eat about a hundred dollars worth of fish and everything. One hundred and nine dollars <laughs> to be exact. Okay, yeah. And uh Kenny goes back and I guess he's trying to barter, and he comes I... back to me and he says, Rico, you gotta take one for the team. And I'm like Okay, <laughs> what do I gotta do? He says that waitress over there wants a kiss. No, no, no. what the waitress? Oh. The general manager of Kingfish. Oh, okay, okay. Now you take it from here. So the general, take... the general manager of Kingfish. When I went back to ask her if there was anything I could trade with her, anything we could give her, some wrestling tickets, autograph pictures, whatever, is because I wasn't really doing uh, all the merchandise I have now. Because as a as a heel, I wasn't allowed to sell any. So. Um, I'm asking her, is there anything I've got we can trade? It's my brother's birthday. Uh, I'm having to pay for all this. And is there any discounts or anything that you can get me uh, to get this bill down a little more reasonable? So I show her the bills, $109. And she looks at me with a big grin on her face. She said, who's that guy sitting over the, that table with you? I said, which one? She says, the guy uh, the guy with the long curly hair and the, and the skin tight WWE shirt. I said, oh, it's Rico Costantino. He's one of our biggest stars on TV. I tell you what I'll do. If you can get him to come back over here behind this, uh, they had a partition there that separated the manager's office from the restaurant. If you can get him to come back over here and give me a kiss, the better kiss he gives me, the more money I'll take off your bill. Now, like I said, okay, well, so I'm counting on 25%. I go over to Rico. Hey, man, I need you to take one for the team. Here's general manager is going to give us a, a discount, big discount. If you go back here and give her a kiss. Okay, Rico says, okay, what I got to do, King? And so I point to her, and he looks over, and he says, yeah, she don't look too bad. All right, we, we can do that. <laughs> and um, so, I'm like I said, I'm expecting 25% minimum, because I know Rico's going to do a good job, 50% max. And uh, and I'm happy either way. I'm just trying to save some damn money. So Rico goes back. He goes back behind her, and he's gone for like eight minutes. <laughs> and I'm wondering if he's coming back. Did they leave together? I don't know what that is. And uh, finally, Rico comes back. He sits down. He says, I think you're taking care of King. I said, really? 
Yep, she seemed pretty happy. I said, okay, well, so the manager comes almost tiptoeing on, on air. She's tiptoeing over to the table. Here you go, Kenny. Here's your bill. She lays it down in front of me, and I picked up the receipt, and it said, zero, zero, zero. <laughs> I said, holy oh, <laughs> what'd you do, banger? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 just uh, some good kisses and uh, good, polite, friendly kiss. That's what that story's telling me in sticking to it, anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, okay, our hundred and nine dollar bill was covered that night, courtesy of Rico Customs. Plus tip. <laughs> well, yeah, we didn't even tip because she <laughs> she said she would take care of that as well. Yeah. We're, we're starting. I'm starting to make everybody dig dig into their pockets for a tip. No, no, no. I'll take care of the waitress. Don't worry about. It. I got it. <laughs> so. I would assume she probably got 30 bucks, you know, 30% for, for taking care of us. So it was about $149 kiss as well. It, it, it shocked me. <laughs> Made my day. <laughs> Money, I was already out in my, in my view. So, yeah. Rico, you got any social media? You active on social media? You got anything to plug? I, I don't do social media because I won't be able to get to answer everybody. And anybody who knows me, I stayed out after house shows, TV shows, before and after. I always, in, even in OVW, somebody wanted to talk. I used to tell them to sit down with me and eat. If I couldn't answer everybody, I don't want to start something I can't if you cover our, If you cover our meal, I'll have sex with you. I'm no good no more. <laughs> Rico, Rico, uh, and that's a shoot. <laughs> old bag out there somewhere to let you. Rico, I got one more story I'm going to ask you about. And I can't remember if you were there for this. I think you might have been. It was in the Sylvester Turkai days as well. We were at Ryan's, and there was a waitress there who, you know, wasn't necessarily all together with it. Yeah, she she was known as being a, a mentally kind of slow yeah. waitress that everyone loved. She was everyone. very sweet. We, we would all be pissed if she ever was not there. And there was a table of uh, rather low class guys there one night, and, and, a, and a cute girl on top of it. Not not only did she have all that going, she was cute and just as sweet as she could be. And there was a, a team of low class guys, and there was of course the OVW table, and they <laughs> we weren't the low class guys this time, not that time. Wow. But, um, and they and they left her a hundred dollars, and she was so excited, mm -hmm. she was just so overjoyed. There's probably like five or six of them. Mm -hmm. She was just so elated. She came, she showed it to everybody. Yeah. Like I said, I don't know if I think you were there, but I can't remember. Made me feel bad. You don't we weren't tipping. We weren't tipping a hundred dollars. Well, this is a great Turkai story either way, and it kind of shows you the man Sylvester Turkai is. So, uh, she's so happy. About twenty minutes later, one one of the guys comes back and says, "Yeah, I need that money back. I didn't mean to give you that." Yeah, we oh. went wrong bill. We meant we meant to leave you ten. Yeah, oh. we accidentally left you a hundred, and they want the hundred back, and we're hearing this go down. Take and they're up. and they're kind of la the buddy the guys in the back are kind of laughing and bear is just looking at the table just getting pissed oh they and, think they're funny sons of bitches and man. if they you really do. and anybody who knows sylvester turkai he doesn't get mad and when he does mm -hmm. god help you mm -hmm. he, i agree i yeah. agree with that yeah just terrifying guy when he's angry and it, like i said it doesn't happen often but when it does and i remember he just he's kind of nodding he's doing that yeah he, he's oh. getting deep sighing uh, the hands hit the table and his hands were like mallets. He stands up, he walks over, he looks at the guy, bear every bit of what would you say, Rico? About six six on bear, six seven? Yeah, he's he's definitely six five up, yeah, at least. And and a jack. But, and wide. Yeah, I and mean wide. Yeah. Yeah. But, and don't know how to work. No, no. Does well, not, it does not care. <laughs> oh, he doesn't know how to work, but I tell you what, he knows how to thump. Yeah, he yeah. knows how he knows how to hurt somebody. He walks yeah. over, he down at the guy and the guy's probably every bit of you know five eleven six foot yeah and the guy looks like a kid next to bear and bear goes you're gonna give her that money the guy goes yeah. man, man we're just joking he goes no you're gonna give her that money trying to be as calm as you can and the guy hands it to her and they just hightailed out of there they wanted no part of turkai none oh no, he even had big hands he, he was big <laughs> everywhere he's just five or six of them and they didn't even think of stepping up and challenging no. him it well, that's some smart people <laughs> and plus he had a little he had me and chris and carlito and i thought you were there maybe you were not it was before no. carlito it would have been oh, I'm, trying think, I'm trying to think of who all would have been who was part of that hell party. i thought carlito was probably there. mark was probably there if i had to guess not not that carlito would have done anything i couldn't get him to pay no no i wasn't me because i'd have been up with turkey if yeah. not before turkey yeah, because uh, you know, you know how I feel about because I've worked with ten different children charities yeah, in my career, and uh, he was just the one that noticed what was going on over the rest. Yeah. and then when we saw what he was staring at, we saw it. And yeah, well, then if he if 
you know, when, when, when somebody gets that look on their face, yeah, you, you know, know it. I you mean, know. I would have been looking going, what's going on there? What's yeah. going on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So here gets mad. There, there's a major problem. Yeah. Well, she got her hundred dollar tip. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, one and thing then, I want to bring up for Kenny. For Thirty. I almost got Kenny killed. <laughs> Which time? In Huntington, West Virginia. Oh, yeah, that's my the one I God. thought you were going oh, for. Oh, my God. You have hey, to... Jeff, are you ready for a story? Yeah, let's hear it. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm going to let Kelly tell, Kenny tell most of it because he remembers it better. Remember but it well. um, we're doing a promo before the show, correct? We're, we're day, be day before. We're, day we're before. We're going to do radio shows and oh, yeah. this nightclub that's going to draw about 1,000 people, give or take. Yep. And uh, it's it's already sold out. I don't know why they sent us there. Uh, but now we're going for standing room only tickets. So Danny Davis and uh, Cornette send us down there to do the promos and get the club uh, and or kind of riled up a little bit and make them want to come see me and Rico get our ass kicked. Remember, riled up a little bit. A little bit. And it's a little place. bit. And this, yeah. is, this is Friday night. Our show's on Saturday. Russ McCullough's on that show who helped launch your career, by the way. And Thank you, Russ. <laughs> scheduled in the main event. Uh, Batista as well. Was Jimmy there? told a funny story about that show too, actually. Batista, uh, Kevin, I can't remember who all was there, but a lot of the, a lot of our guys that made it big in the WWE are on this show. So, but me and Rico are the ones sent down to get everybody riled up, and then everyone else is coming down the next day to join us. And because uh, it's in Huntington, West Virginia, and it's good three four hours from uh, wherever you live at in Louisville. So we go down there, and um, Rico and I decide to interrupt the disc jockey that's there, kind of uh, and, and brazenly. <laughs> these are these are country folk, to say the least. Honey, yes. by God, West Virginia, it's called that for a reason. Uh, <laughs> because it was abandoned by God. 120 counties there out of 120 all voted for Trump to tell you how this place is. I mean, your state sucks. And <laughs> they voted the worst state in the, in the union. So uh, we get up there and we're, and we're cutting promos back and forth. Me and Rico are, are taking turns doing little jabs at the people of West Virginia to make sure that they're irked a little bit and that whoever yep. has bought a ticket will buy one and make sure that we got standing room only in the upper balconies for this show that we're going to do. And uh, our, our goal is to get about another 300 tickets sold on top of the thousand that are already sold. So uh, he tells a, he tells a rib on him. I tell one. He tells one. I tell one. And Rico decides that he has one more promo, one little one little joke on West Virginia he wants to tell that I didn't know he was going to do. And he says, "Hey Kenny, why was the toothbrush invented in West Virginia? I don't know, Rico. Why? Because if it was invented anywhere else, it'd be called a teeth brush." And oh, they got pissed. That little toothbrush. Jeff, where'd you go? Jeff's gone. <laughs> that, <laughs> that little toothbrush joke caused him to rush the stage. Rico and I had to be escorted out there by security. One of those pieces of fans took my briefcase and had my wallet and my cell phone, which was bigger than his damn Coke can. No, it was big, bigger than his hairbrush. The Pauly special. And yeah. uh, it wasn't quite as big as Pauly's, but it was the first cell phone I ever had. That's gone. My wallet's gone. All my promotional shit's gone. I admit, I got nothing now. No briefcase for the show the following night. Cornette had to pick me up one. And uh, they chased the guy to the hotel and took my shit, but he disappeared into one of the rooms. They couldn't find him. And uh, and they were threatening to kill us. They had to get us into our rooms, and we couldn't leave our rooms. We had to order in. Uh, yep. And uh, we, we finally were snuck out at about 6 o'clock in the morning to go do AM radio shows. Moved us to another hotel so they would leave us alone. Of all the over things, two, over of all the things show. to get that level of heat over, it was a. <laughs> I thought the other stuff was way more insulting, but they did not. Yeah, they did. Yeah, like but complain. then I found out that, that town had summer teeth. Some are here, some are there, some are in their pocket. <laughs> we found that out the next night. So yeah, they did. Yeah, not to that. I, I'd like to say one thing before we go. Uh, R.I.P. The brain heated. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. God. Um, Absolutely. I mean, I, I loved him in Monsoon uh, in the 80s. I mean, they, he, they would always crack me up. Bobby Heenan was masterful at what he did. And a bump-taking son of a gun. I tell you. Best bump-takers ever. I tell you, we lost, we lost a gem. 
Yeah, I got, I just got to spend a day with him at Cornette's house where they were shooting a video. And then a couple of nights later, I got to do a, a bit with him at OVW that neither of us, he refused to even tell me what we were going to do, uh, which was cool with me because that's doing it old school. And that's how I wanted to do it. And he, he says, Kenny, all I'm going to tell you is that I'm going to pay homage to you. I'm going to give you a gift and acknowledge that you are now the man. I'm passing the torch. You're the <laughs> And, and we carried on with that. It's on my best of DVD that, uh, I don't know. Well, I'm glad it is. It ain't going to be the best of, but these are one of the DVDs I sell. This is the star, and uh, this is another one that I sell. And there's like six DVDs I sell for 20 bucks each. Hand me that book there, friends. Got to get my shit in. Yeah. Put yourself on your own show. Yeah. Look, myself. They know who you are. They wouldn't oh, be watching. Man, they know me. You're right. I guess Rico should be yeah, plugging. Rico, do you have anything you would like to plug? Well, well, your book well, well, would be. Well, wait a minute. What, wait a minute. What about, well, what about my, my Cardinal Beats headphones? Surely to God. Somebody. There you go. Louisville Cardinals. Louisville Cardinals. We're, we're, we're winning games. And uh, Two Cow did an early appearance. My book, I probably screwed you too, dedicated to Rico, Maya, by the way. Maya's so hiding every... in the back. She just got home. Maya, hey, Doodle. Maya, get in here and say hi. Hey. Get in here, bitch. I, see, her. I oh. see the reflection in the TV. Now she's ducking. Yeah, she's ducking. <laughs> but, okay, and so go on with Heenan. One of the funniest and greatest bits I ever got to do. Never rehearsed a word, and he loved it. I loved it. One of the nicest men I ever met, and God, have we lost something there. Just yeah. Anyone that ever tries to compare me and say, oh, you're as good as Heenan or almost good. Oh, my God, bullshit. None yeah. of them. He was so much higher than the rest of us, and that includes me, Cornette, Jimmy Hart, uh, the Grand Wizard, who the hell ever you think a great manager was. He was way Big the Daddy, hell up here. Big Daddy Ding of the uh, the free press. Yeah. Well, hey, Principal may agree with me with this. I bet you, I bet you, that on the way up to heaven, Bobby Heenan cut a promo on St. Peter at the Pearly Gates. I'm sure. Called him a ham and egger. Ham and egger. Yeah. I, I know. And if I know Bobby, I bet you he's trying to be a manager in heaven. He's oh, got to be looking to be a manager. He's like the 12 apostles. Yeah. I know he's going to manage one of them. And for Kenny, 12 Judas, apostles Judas, are the uh, people who are around with Jesus. Who are the apostles? <laughs> they're the people who follow Jesus. <laughs> they're the 12 people that follow Jesus around. What when he walked swerved him at the end? I'm, I'm not a, yeah. I'm not. And that's who Bobby's going to manage. Yeah, he's well, going to take I'm him back Judas. to the top. Yeah, yeah. He's going I'm, I'm, I'm to be in Judas's corner. I'm not a follower. Yeah. I'm a leader. I wouldn't be following anybody around, so I wouldn't be one of them. <laughs> yeah, uh, Bobby's up there managing Judas. He's got, a, he's got a lot of good talent up there. You got uh, yeah. well, you got Rod Steele. <laughs> Rod Steele's up there, and uh, you got uh, you got her, uh, uh, the Ultimate Warrior, Hercules. He called his own death, by the way. That's impressive when you can do that. That was that's. Yeah. Right. Go back and look at guys. I hate to jump off here. I got to start getting ready. Rico, always a pleasure. I love you. Thank you so much. It's been great to see you again to talk to you. Jeff, it was great to finally get to see you. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. Um, this, also, this was only supposed to be a 10 minute show. What happened? <laughs> we went long, we oh, went over. Guys, I'll see you later. Uh, Rico blew the damn time cue. If only Pritchard were here to slap him. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> oh, well, maybe next time. Maybe yeah. Russo will be here to slap one of us next time. How about that? Uh, any any more questions there, uh, Jeff? You know, it's hard to uh, sometimes keep up with people, especially when you don't have social media. So I think a lot of people that were fans of you, you know, will enjoy seeing this and, and good to get your face back out there. I, I love all the fans. Uh, your Facebook, right? I, I get it, but I, Kenny, you know how you answer everybody and you tell, you know, I, I'm physically wow. incapable of answering everybody. And if I miss a person, Thank you know you. I'm going to feel like crap. I feel bad, too. I do. Yeah. So, I mean, if they want to get a hold of me, they can always contact you. You've already done that for me. Yeah, thanks. Dump that load on me. Yeah, thanks. Well, you're the, you're the king. I'm the king. I don't, I don't <laughs> teach me to lay claim to that. <laughs> long so, you know, um, for the fans out there, I could say I'm better than I was. I but I'm not what I used to be. You know, um, everything's I'm, kind of leveled off. I'm not what I used to be. I'm 300 pounds more. Ooh, yeah, but you wear well, it well. Well, 200 more now. We, we've lost 140 pounds. So, so That's good. Keep going on that one. But 25-pound crown, I got to lose a little more weight. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to say yeah, a couple things are serious. 
you know, and like Kenny said, I thought I was going down for the count a couple of times. Oh, yeah. uh, yes, you were too, so. Yeah, and I'm glad I'm not. And of us like me, you and Lawler, we, we kick out at the two and two and a half or two point nine. So. Yeah, I, I got the kick out. And I wish it was just one thing that's got me. I think it's about that six. I have six ailments uh, that have tagged tag me and uh like i said bolinitis ain't helping him none either no bolinitis but i also want to thank everybody from the paypal thank everybody for the gofundme chris jericho as far as i know was the only wwe superstar to help me and and he even came to my house and interviewed me and and also uh uh, who's the uh got lillian no the the group out there that came and, and helped you out as well oh oh cauliflower alley Cauliflower Alley, yeah. Uh, pardon yeah. me for remembering. Yeah, they you. helped me uh, so I could stay in my house. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. Oh, and I want to say uh, when we say that the police department turned their back on me, that it, that's not really. Uh, they didn't turn their back on me. What happens in a state job, and any police officer will vouch for this, is that you have annual time, you have sick time, and when you run out of that, you get something called catastrophic leave, where people donate time to help you get through your illness. Well, I have exhausted all three of those avenues, so the state had no no other uh, direction but to put me on leave without pay. It was not a choice. It's just how the states run. So I was on leave without pay for six months. And then when, because they only meet once a month for medical reasons to give people medical retirement throughout the whole state of Nevada. So mine finally came up in February uh, 2017 because I had to retire in December without pay or coverage. And all, and it was like $600 a month to pay for insurance without the state's help. So I just want to thank everybody, but I wanted to clear that up is that the state just did what the state does. You know, they have laws and I just exhausted everything because of the illnesses. But thank you, everybody, for praying and thinking of me. And I miss you all. I miss the fans the most. Kenny, any plugs for this episode? Well, you know, there is. Uh, got a <laughs> plug good folks over at Colin Elbow, the people that sponsor my t shirts, the, the new bowling club shirts that you saw chris wearing during the show you can order those directly through me or you can go through uh collar uh, x elbow i think it is on the website and if you mention the uh passcode star maker or i think it's either star, i think it's star maker uh you get 10 percent off and uh and you can order your shirts directly that way uh if you'd like but of course i always like it when you get them through me because i send you a little something extra a little signed picture uh, just a little something extra for your trouble for ordering directly through me because I make more money if you order them through me. <laughs> so, um, so shout out to them. Shout out to the good people at uh, Ray Miato. They have a huge announcement they're going to be making. So I'm going to make it here. Listen to this, Rico. Ray Miato is putting together a deal uh, for all the people that suffered through the hurricanes in Texas and the hurricanes in Florida. Not much we can do for the people in Puerto Rico, but for all those that lost a car, and uh, are obviously waiting on insurance money or what have you to be able to get their cars replaced. If you want to go through Rami Auto, you can go through RamiAuto.com, contact them and mention that you heard about them through Kenny Starmaker Bowling. And, uh, and I'm going to give you a contact name. His name is Demetrius Moore. He's on my Facebook page. Look up Demetrius Moore, contact him on Facebook and say, hey, I heard that uh, you got this special deal you're doing for hurricane victims. If you mention my name, uh, Demetrius will make it to where your car will be delivered to you in either Florida or Texas, all the way from Princeton, West Virginia. Now, what do you think about that? That's, that's, that's pretty good. cool. That is good. And, uh, and they've got two other lots in Virginia, one in Princeton, West Virginia, and, uh, they're not a paid sponsor yet. They're just good people that we're working with. We're hoping to have them as a paid sponsor. Uh, once I start doing my podcast one shows on a regular basis and bump, one of these other ham and eggers that's taken up my time slot. Um, in tribute to Bobby Heen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> ham and egger. I, I always refused to call anybody a ham and egger because I felt that was Heenan's. But uh, in tribute to Bobby, we'll, we'll use it tonight. Uh, what, what a man he was. And um, so shout out to them. Shout out to Mulligan's Meats who just sent me another shipment of uh, their teriyaki beef jerky. Oh my God, that stuff is good. Shout out to Dippin' Donuts. You just sent me like 72 donuts in the mail the other day. It, it takes a long time to eat 72 donuts. I shouldn't be doing that. But I, so I shared them with the family. 
Not a lot. God, I'm, I'm going to send a message through the internet to slap you. <laughs> 72 donuts. Turkey and donut. Oh, there's still 30 of them in the fridge right now, man. There, there's a lot. <laughs> These donuts, they're like three or four times the size of a regular donut. I didn't know what I was getting into. He said, what, oh he said, what can we do for a shout out? I said, I don't know. Send me 72, 72 donuts. They weighed 40 pounds, <laughs> this box of donuts that came. Cost them like 60 bucks to ship them to me. And so from now on, we're going to only order like 24 at a time every other month. Because that's all. Eddie, you're, you're killing me, Smalls. Shipping donuts. <laughs> Hey, I lost 140 pounds. I'm entitled to a four-pound donut when I want one. Oh, my God. Out loud. Jelly-filled, by the way. I like it. Oh, Jeff, help me. Are <laughs> good. You should eat one. Come on over. Everybody, I got plenty. Oh, my God. <laughs> if you ship that, it's $3. Everybody, everybody but Russo, being as he's stuck in Dallas, so we wouldn't want to inconvenience him or anything. He's probably in the air right now, actually, as, as well, we're filming this. better hope he's in the air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Safe land, Vince. I might be at the airport waiting at Evansville, right? Yeah. Might be down there waiting on him and escort him home. With donuts. Oh, I'm sorry. That's Cornette's job. <laughs> yeah. We <laughs> didn't even get into your analyzation of the emails that Jimmy sent me. I wish we'd have done wow. that. I know we're like two hours now, but we'll, wow. we'll have to have you on at least for a segment for another show to where yeah. your experience of 30 years as a cop can analyze those emails that he sent. We won't reveal them. Right. Uh, but I think we should know what was sent to me and and Rico's analyzation of 30 years as a cop of what the content of those emails was. Uh, but yeah, I well, you know, emails. bodyguard and a cop, because when I would bodyguard clients, I would receive the hate mail and stuff like that and have to ascertain if we're going to that town. Yeah. You know, when I was guarding Betty Hinn, one guy sent something from Canada, signed it and said, I'll be waiting for you. Yeah, that's brilliant. And I'll be a son of a gun if that guy wasn't there in the sixth row that's, that's what at a crusade. Didn't have any weapons on him, but he was scouting. Unbelievable. Yeah. But that's we'll crazy. go on another show for that. And, and, yeah. and do remember that uh, that Rico uh, loved Jimmy from the bottom of his heart. Probably still. Yeah. I, and, well, actually, but, I do too. I'm just uh, disturbed yeah. that, uh, that this all came to a head because uh, I wasn't allowed to be friends with Vince Russo. And I wasn't uh, allowed to work on Vince Russo's network. Well, I, I call bullshit on that to anybody. If Rico told me I couldn't be friends with somebody, I'd say, well, sorry, Rico. It don't, it don't work that way. Number uh, one, he'd never do that to me. That's what best friends do. Yeah. And uh, so I, I'm sorry it came to this. And I, I still love Jimmy. I don't wish him any harm. Uh, I, I, helped, I like Jimmy, too. He helped me with my career. No, but those emails uh, were, were concerning. They were yes. very concerning. Yes. That they were disturbing. I'm not post them. I'm not going to reveal them. Yeah. But uh, R Rico asked me to send them to him because he knew I was disturbed by what the, the content, and he wanted to use his 30 years as a cop to analyze those. And and yeah. we'll, we'll do and talk about that on another show, but I, I will never post them unless no. somebody comes with me, and, and let's hope that don't happen. No, I hope yeah. not. But I like way. I said, it, it was dis disconcerting. And then coming from somebody I knew, not 40 years, I mean, you guys are coming up on 20, but I knew the man, you know, for two years straight, worked – Almost every day, you know, worked right. you every day, but, you know, did the shows and yeah. was a big life in Sin's life because we're always having feuds. And yeah. I, I was, I, you know, that was, it was more disheartening to me that I knew the man and had to analyze what I analyzed. Right. You know? so, and I, it was, and it was I, hard. I, I, it was know, hard. I, I know Jimmy's got his people out there that are, are going to hate me and think I'm such a dirty dog that, that I, uh, they said you weren't loyal to Jimmy. Well, I made it clear I'm not loyal to anybody. I'm not loyal to Vince Russo. Vince has been a friend. Vince opened the door for me. and yeah. uh, But I'm, I'm a man, not a dog. I don't ask Rico to be loyal to me. I'm sure that Rico's dealt with people I don't like. I've dealt with people that Rico don't like. But yeah. we just avoid each other during those times. We don't say, well, I'm not going to be your friend no more. Because to me, that's fifth grade bullshit. And I'm not going to play that yeah. game. Not with Jimmy, not with Rico, not with Vince Russo, not anybody. So no. that's where I stand on that. And, you, gotta, and uh, you and I are friends because you and I are friends. It, well, that's, and yeah. And this that's isn't fifth grade. You can't say you're my friend, not his friend. That's yeah, fifth grade stuff. That's, that's where I thought me and Jimmy were. And yeah. apparently, yeah. so that's, well, on, that's on him. Well, I don't know if he like. I know he doesn't like God either, but I pray for him and hope something happens. Well, I didn't like him. I just said uh, one of the 12 got to walk around with him. So I'm just. <laughs> 
<laughs> there's hope for you yet, Kenny. Yeah, there, there's a lot of people saying that. There's hope. Not much, hope. but there is hope. Well, well Jeff, well, Jeff, we, I know you'll make this all uh, Jeff, so yes. this makes sense. Out of here. Yeah. They this damn thing themselves. They can hit stop. No, oh, yeah, but if if you didn't catch the first episode, if you're stumbling on this through the annals of the internet, go to russosbrand.com, click that YouTube link. The first episode of The Brolin Alley still up there for free uh, two weeks from prior to this episode. September 13th was the air date, so you get introduced to Kenny. It was a good show. So, Rico, Rico, thanks for joining us tonight. Kenny, any last words for Rico and for our uh, loyal listeners? Uh, for Rico, I love you, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on and explaining this Bruce Pritchard situation because he wouldn't. And uh, thank you, listeners, for tuning in. Hopefully you enjoyed the show. And if you did, come back and see some more. I'm not everybody's cup of tea, but I don't beg you to watch or download the show. I do it for those that like it and enjoy it. If you don't, find something else to watch, just like I do on television, just like I might do when I see that first new episode of Star Trek. I might think it sucks. I'm not going to write them a letter and tell them how much I hate them. I'll move on to another show. So treat me the same way. If you like it, come on back. And if you don't, well, go go listen to Bruce Pritchard. Thanks, Dad. <laughs>